Well, good evening, everyone. Welcome to the Board of Selectmen regular meeting on September 25th, 2017. Please rise for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. We begin uh, We begin tonight's meeting. No, Mr. Kalishman. Mr. Kalishman, this is not appropriate. Please be seated. I will explain. Shut us up before we even start. Uh, tonight we start our meeting with a heavy heart. Sinsbury has lost two great public servants. Deputy Chief Michael Japil of the Fire District, who served this community for 40 years and Michael Areno of the Public Building Committee. Please join us for a moment of silence. Thank you, everyone. Our heart, thoughts and prayers are with both families. Um, tonight, we are holding two public hearings. One will be to receive comment from individuals who do not participate in one of the focus groups, an opportunity to provide input on the town manager selection process. You may give your comments or ask questions during that time period. We will then hold our regular public audience uh, at the close of the first public hearing. Before we begin that, I wanted to uh, amend the agenda. We need to add three items. Under presentations, I'd like to add a budget. Update from Representative Hampton and Senator Wickos. I'll take a motion on all three once we get to it. Before item A, add an agenda item to approve the use of town hall parking lot for our Harvest Food Drive collection in support of the Sunsbury Food Closet on October 8th. And third, before item D, add an agenda item authorizing the first select woman to submit a grant application for the Kerma Excellence and Risk Management Award gift for the Department of Public Works. May I have that motion? So moved. Second. We'll go with Chris and Elaine. All in favor, please say aye. 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 The motion carries unanimously. We will now open the public hearing to receive public comment for individuals who did not participate in one of the focus groups, an opportunity to provide input on the town manager selection process. We will begin with a PowerPoint presentation from members of the personnel subcommittee and uh, go from there. Sean, you want to start us off? Sure. So uh, I think as Chris articulated to me earlier, this uh, PowerPoint is going to be available on TV and on the town website afterwards. So if folks want to see it uh, or uh, read through it more uh, more closely, they, they'll have the opportunity to do so. Um, but just a, a couple of quick points. Um, again, how did we get here? Um, as many of you uh, fondly remember, we, uh, we uh, have to review our town charter from time to time and um, this board uh, instituted one of those reviews back in uh, June of 2015. Um, the Charter Revision Commission met uh, a significant number of times, significant public comment, great discussion, uh, and worked together to, to draft a final report. That final uh, report was delivered to this board on August of 2016. Uh, and there were basically six uh, key points to that. The change of the form of government, which we're here to talk about this evening, um, now that that's been adopted and we're moving towards the town manager form of government, um, seeking that individual that is uh, going to be our town manager. There's also some cleaning up the language, uh, eliminating the Human Re um, Relations Committee, making amendments to the Economic Development Commission, which you heard us talk about last time, uh, expand the Open Space Committee to include additional uh, members and input, clarify some changes on the town budget uh, and the process, and then to make sure that our, our language was uh, gender neutral and appropriate for public office. Um, all six of those uh, uh, recommendations were adopted at referendum by the residents of, of this community. This slide speaks to what's some of the most significant change between the first selectman board of selectmen form of government versus the town manager board of selectmen form of government. And what we'd have you think is there's really two key leadership um, positions uh, that are involved in running the board of selectmen. One is in relation to managing the administrative functions and the administrative staff. And the second is really uh, being the leader of the legislative process. So this slide really speaks to that. The uh, top is talking about the first selectman, board of selectmen form um, of government. Obviously, there's no town manager, so there's no responsibilities that a town manager has in that form of government. 
uh, in terms of what's the first selectman's role in that current form of government, they really are act as both leaders, elected as the chief executive official, managing all administrative staff and management uh, administrative functions, and then they also are the chief legislative official working with the Board of Selectmen. And in terms of the role of the Board of Selectmen, we serve as the legislative body of the town, and the charter has a host of responsibilities and accountabilities that we have in that role. So transitioning to the bottom row, which is speaking to the town manager, Board of Selectmen form of government, the town manager now, instead of the first select person, is appointed as the chief executive official and supervises town departments. The first select person retains the role exclusively as the chief legislative official, and the board of select, person retain, or select persons retains all of the responsibility serving as the legislative body of the town. None of the accountabilities and responsibilities shift for the board. There is one additional one that emerges from this form of government is the Board of Selectmen appoints and oversees the performance of the town manager. So there are other aspects that change, but this really is the key structural change between our current form of government and a town manager form of government. On the next slide um, is just a discussion of what are the budgetary and staffing impacts of the change to a town manager, Board of Selectmen form of government. Uh, the the, the uh, Director of Administrative Services position will no longer be included in the town budget or organizational structure. The town manager will receive a full-time salary. This figure has not yet been determined, but a range of approximately $140,000 to $160,000 has been budgeted on a prorated pro -rated basis for fiscal year 2018. And the first select person will no longer receive a full-time salary he or she will receive, in essence, a stipend to offset the costs associated with fulfilling the duties of the position. The figure has not yet been determined, and formally this figure will be set by the next Board of Selectmen. But we have, as a group, uh, coalesced around the concept of $10,000, which has been budgeted on a prorated basis for fiscal year 2018. In essence, when you look at the math, uh, the cost uh, between one form of government and the next is basically a wash. Um, this last slide um, sort of takes you where are we going from here. Um, the change will take effect on December 4th, 2017. That's when the new charter goes into effect and when the new Board of Selectmen will be seated. Uh, the current Board of Selectmen is serving as the executive search committee for the town manager position um, in addition to Tom Cook and Melissa Appleby. Uh, the personnel subcommittee is functioning as a subcommittee of that executive search committee. After the elections in November, um, um, several people today had questions about what happens then. Um, what we would plan to do is that this board of selectmen will invite any newly elected members to participate in the process after the election. Um, the reason for that is to smooth the transition between one board and the next board regarding the hiring process because this board cannot hire the town manager then the town manager must be officially hired by the next board um, so that that is the plan um, we plan to be completely transparent and inclusive um, with whatever the next board looks like um, after the final the final appointment and the employment agreement will be ratified by the new board of selectmen on december 4th 2017. That That's it. the last slide. Uh -huh. so, so just the next uh, item that we just would identify is as part of this process, the board did determine that we wanted to utilize the services of an outside consultant. <coughs> and in the spring, we did an RFP for uh, consulting firms that specialize in hiring uh, high-level administrative municipal staff. Uh, the firm and the individual uh, that was ultimately selected by the Board of Selectmen is Mr. Don Jutton, who is the Principal of Municipal Resources Incorporated. Mr. Jutton is here uh, with us tonight. Um, and uh, part of what uh, Mr. John has been doing is soliciting input into the formulation of a candidate profile. In essence, what we're trying to do is identify a statement as to what are the ideal attributes 
of the town manager for Simsbury and what are some of the key uh, strategic issues that they're going to face. One way that we did that was through the uh, resident and employee survey that was online several months ago. So that data has been incorporated into the statement. Uh, additionally, Don has interviewed all of the direct reports to the first select person, as well as some other key constituencies. That uh, further fed the candidate profile. And today we had three focus groups uh, where we had individuals come in and again speak to attributes and key strategies, and that will further refine it. And I did want to give the opportunity for Don to come up and speak to us a little bit more about the exact process in terms of recruiting individuals. Yes. Thanks. Uh, it's good to see some of you again and <laughs> others I spent more time with than probably you or I care to talk about today. <laughs> uh, in any event, our firm, just kind of a quick thumbnail, our firm has been in business since 1989. We are all refugees from local government service. Um, I was a town manager for about 16 years before forming the company. Uh, we have 17 full-time employees, uh, three other people who have been public managers, uh, two retired police chiefs, a retired fire chief, and a couple of retired Indian chiefs. Um, we recruit along with doing all kinds of other business. We bill ourselves as a small local government in a box. Anything a municipality of 35,000 or less can, does in New England, we do in one fashion or another and provide support services to them. We've worked in about 500 towns and cities throughout New England since we were formed. <clears throat> and uh, we've actually gone a little bit further outside New England, but our specialty really is small New England communities. We've recruited several hundred public senior level officials, police chiefs, fire chiefs, and town managers. Uh, we started our process um, early in July uh, after working with you folks. Uh, we've received 40 resumes. Um, of those 40, 16 folks met the minimum qualifications, which was education and experience working as in management positions in local government. Since that time, we have uh, sent out written essays, six written essay questions associated with challenges or issues either in the public management business generically or specifically related to Simsbury. Those responses were received last week and we're in the process. We have a team of three past managers reviewing those responses. We'll shortlist from there down to eight or ten who will be interviewed on the te on telephone after we do a public data search um, so that we have some sense of why they left their last position, if they've been involved in controversial issues, have they been fired, those kinds of issues. We'll do telephone interviews with them. We'll shortlist again and bring uh, three to five here on the ground for interviews in the middle of October. And then from that, we'll bring back potentially one or two of those to the joint uh, interview process post uh, election. Um, beyond that, once we have selected or once you all have selected a final candidate will do a full in-depth background investigation, which is a police type background investigation, uh, which looks at um, their education, verifies education, verifies experience, looks at past performance, reference checks, those kinds of things. And then we'll assist with establishing an employment agreement, goals and objectives, hopefully um, from the board for the next manager in terms of establishing some basis for performance evaluation at the end of six months, nine months, and 12 months. Mm -hmm. uh, that's where we are. Uh, today culminated the data gathering in terms of the community. Uh, I apologize to those of you who were with me today. You'll be hearing this again. But we base our approach on the, on the notion <clears throat> that every community has a personality very much like a person. And for us to do our job well, we need to understand your personality. Um, managing in the public sector is a skill set. Um, and it's important for us to find people with the qualifications, but more, more or of equal importance 
is managing your specific community. What does your community need? What does it expect? What are the challenges that it face, faces? <clears throat> and so I think we've got a fairly good handle on uh, the challenges and issues that um, the community faces, not the least of which is the current financial state of affairs in the state. Beyond that, you're a healthy community. <clears throat> one of the, one of the, as I said today, uh, it, this is a community that likes itself. And you are truly unique uh, in the communities we've seen in terms of um, your overall uh, health, both financially, but uh, just in terms of, of what you have to offer the citizens. Uh, your pride in your school system is laudable. For many of the places where we work, um, children are a liability. The community don't want them, don't want their children, don't want to bear the cost of educating them. Uh, you folks, um, have done a remarkable job in terms of uh, developing a school system that really is part of your identity. So you have far more positives than the very few negatives that we saw, and most of those negatives were external and uncontrollable for you. So that's the story from here. Thank you. Um, in terms of public participation, obviously the public had a, the ability to participate in what a town manager is through the town charter revision process. Uh, Town news and announcement was sent out, letting people know about the focus groups. And not, the town news and announcement was sent out, let, knowing about town surveys. And tonight, we are also doing this as well. It's for those who don't come to our meetings regularly, anyone in any meeting can speak to this issue. So we welcome the community's input and thank everyone who has uh, given comments on it. So with that, we'll open it up for comments or questions. And uh, let me ask here. a question. Well, why don't you have a seat? Because they may be to the board, <laughs> or they may be to you. <laughs> Or there may be no questions. There may just be comments. So I'll start and I'll go from back to front, left to right. Uh, Mark. Mm -hmm. Yes, please. And if you, uh, there, I think, believe there's a piece of paper there. If you don't mind writing your name and address after you speak, just so that we can um, help our recording clerk. And we'll go five minutes. If anyone feels they need more, we'll come back. I won't need five minutes. Okay. Mark Lubetkin. Uh, 170 Sweet Tog Street, also of uh, Sims, uh, Simsbury's favorite uh, pub, the Redstone Pub. Um, I had a, an experience today that I needed to share. I got an announcement from the town about the feedback uh, through a specifically a uh, focus group for the town manager, and I responded back about 10 minutes after the email came out. And thank you, Lisa, for having such a great team managing this, and I appreciate it. Um, I was selected to participate this afternoon at noon, and I went in at, at 12.02, and the introductions had already been done, so I did not know Don's name until now. Um, but Don was talking, and, and, and people were sitting around, and I recognized almost everyone in the room, and I realized after looking around the room and seeing the sign-in sheet, I was the only small business person in the room at the time. Uh, there were three selectmen, I believe, and Mr. Cook, thank you, sir. Um, after a couple people had spoken, I, I asked a question, and I said, who's taking notes and is there a recording? Because if this is a focus group, a focus group is a specific research tool. It's not just a bunch of people sitting around giving input. And the response I got was, it's in my head, but that's not a focus group. That's input. And then Chris said to me, we decided not to record this meeting. Chris, who was we, if you don't mind my asking? Uh, the personnel subcommittee that was structuring the meetings, Mark, first of all, we, we actually talked about the advantages and disadvantages of having it on SCTV. We decided not to put it on SCTV because we felt it might inhibit some of the comments that people made in the room. And then we also determined not to take spe have a specific set of notes taken because primarily what we wanted this to be was an interaction between members of the executive committee, including Don, an opportunity for, for us to learn, refine our own thinking relative to the profile, and we all took our own notes during the process. So we did make a deliberate decision not to really have a consolidated set of notes. Okay. Um, I don't agree with that decision. I'm sorry. I think it's the wrong decision. I think that as a public forum, if you put it out as a focus group and you understand what a focus group is, you need to have a recording or at least somebody taking notes. In an environment like that, you don't have to put the person's name down for what was said, but you need to record what was said. It's important. 
Because if we're invited to provide feedback and the feedback gets swept under the carpet like it often does here, then we have an issue with the openness of our community. And that's not what Simsbury should be about. I was at the Chamber of Commerce today. Are you aware that the Chamber of Commerce had no opportunity to provide input directly as a small business? Simsbury, as you know, I love. I do not agree that Simsbury is business friendly. I think that the processes in this town are business negative. And if we're going to hire a town manager that has had no impact or input from the business community toward that selection, I think it's the wrong direction. I'm a little upset that these focus groups are happening after the 40 candidates have already been screened and we're down to 18. So how are we educating the selection process, which I also know a little bit about as well, and it seems a little backwards. There are influencers in this town and there are those people who are influenced. I'm not an influencer, I'm an influenced. But I do try to make the best effort to be the best volunteer in this community to make a positive change. And I'm tired of getting swept under the rug. During the Charette process, when I was on the Historic District Commission, as a commission, we went forward and spoke with the people providing the focus groups, real focus groups with recordings and notes and a, a selection of the important parts, a real focus group following the methodology. An entire chapter out of the final draft of the Charette, based upon the historic information, was deleted. So my comments were completely irrelevant. My time was wasted. That's not appropriate. We need to make this town more business friendly. The recharter, not re, um, the review, re, the Charter Review Commission, I spoke with them about consolidating the planning and, and zoning department so that I could have an experience similar to what I had in Farmington or similar to what I had in Glastonbury, which was very positive as opposed to coming to this town and having a very negative experience going through the business model that we had. Now granted, that's just six and a half years ago, seven years ago, and it has gotten much better under Lisa and her team. I know that. But it still has a lot of room for improvement. And if we don't take these steps toward making it a positive experience for businesses, we're going to have the Hartford and other places leaving. So I think it was a mistake not to have it as a formal process. My only input that I wanted to provide was make the town manager somebody who is business friendly and has a track record of working with business and small business in particular to keep the character of this community what it is and advance it on our tax base and our small businesses. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Don, could you please speak to the process of why the focus groups were done after some of the selection process and the thinking methodology there? <laughs> the primary reason was time. Uh, the fact of the matter is right now in New England, for every town manager, qualified town manager, there's probably three vacancies. And so what we're finding, just by way of example, that we've seen a reduction of about 50% in the pool of candidates that we're searching. We currently have seven searches underway. And so what we're seeing is, is little infill into the profession. As We've got a bunch of old folks like me who are retiring out of the profession. There was not a lot of infill in public management over the last probably three generations. Youngsters wanted to make their millions before they were 30. Uh, you can't do that in the public sector and stay on the right side of jail. So you don't get into this business if you want to make a lot of money. Um, so what we're finding is that the pool of candidates is, is very small. And so w what we did when we looked at the deadlines that you had to meet was to get the ads out on the street as quickly as we could get them out. And as you know, um, the f we had to extend the deadline to get to 40. And so, you know, essentially the notion was to get this rolling as quickly as we could. Uh, we had to deal with the issues of summer, both mine and yours, in terms of the ability to schedule things and get things done. Um, and so this was as early as we could put it together. From my experience, <clears throat> the, the focus group doesn't influence at all the people who apply. It will be, they will, whoever is interested in the position will apply. Where we need the information coming from the community is in filtering <coughs> out 
when we get down to the final interview process, what are the skill sets, what are the issues, what are the background and, and experience that we're looking for in people? Lisa, I would, I would add, this is the last stage of a public feedback process that started several months ago. <clears throat> yeah. And uh, we, we actu actually approached today and defined today as a final refinement of insight into the profile to help us be most effective with the interview process. The first phase was the surveys that we did, which were 100% documented. We have all the results of those. We have the results uh, integrated into a document that, that fed into the profile. Um, so I think that we have an absolute commitment to transparency and listening to the community and incorporating the feedback uh, into uh, the document that we're using. Mark, I apologize if today we left you feeling that that was not necessarily the case or going to be the case. Um, but we did articulate that today was really a final refinement in a conversation with the executive committee um, um, relative to the, the profile. And, and I found it served the purposes that we were looking for. There were some very unique refinements that I personally walked away with uh, from, from other feedback that we've gotten based <coughs> on the conversations today. Uh, it is fair to say that this was not run as a pure, scientifically run focus group. I can speak to that because I've been running focus groups for about 25 years. I currently manage all of the focus groups uh, for the company I work for. And in a focus group, you do document all the feedback, so you have very clear criteria to be able to respond to. But it is also a legitimate use of what we are doing today, and, and you can call it a focus group to take a look at the profile that's already been defined and to have kind of a final refinement of it. Okay, so we'll go on with public comments. Joan? I didn't expect to speak tonight about this because I feel, first of all, I've been a proponent for town manager for over 30 years. <laughs> and I think that Simsbury finally needs a town manager and I hope that nobody mucks it up so we get the wrong person. Uh, as far as the new board and the old board and all this talk is totally nonsensical because the new board is the old board with maybe one or two different people running for office. So this board will be the decider <laughs> for the town manager. That's number one. Uh, Mark is absolutely correct that uh, as far as focus groups goes, uh, nobody is really interested in pursuing it. I went to a focus group uh, during the time that we had the charrette. And I walk into the room and they said, well, we want public input and we want everybody who was there, all the developers, they already uh, fixed their little pieces and parts and it was all done. This is also what appears to be trying to be open, but if you don't leave notes, uh, background information, uh, everybody will think that it's a fix and somebody is getting some special favor. We can't allow this to happen. We want the best, the finest. And Mark is absolutely correct that open government means openness. It was a public meeting. You cannot just ignore the public and not making the information. Nobody goes to the library uh, during the middle of the day, early in the morning and whatever, but they want to know what people are talking about. And this, this was flawed, totally flawed. In my opinion, the uh, consultant has been in business for all these years. The consultant looks at background information. The consultant looks at who the, uh, what the town is about. He can get all the information that he needs. He doesn't need special interest people coming in and giving him input into something. Uh, all the input is there because we do publicize and put in minutes of meetings and other things that he can review. He can't review the focus group. Other people can. He was there. Other people can't review the focus group because we have no documentation. This was totally flawed. And my opinion is that he is paid to do the job and do it right. And if he doesn't do it right, he'll hear from us. There's no doubt about it. But we are paying him to do the job. We are not paying the special interest to come and skew the process. 
And when you don't have minutes and you don't have anything documented, it's skewed. And that is certainly a black mark on the people who developed this. And so that is my opinion. I hope he does give us the right person. I think we need somebody who can listen to people and make decisions. We need a decision maker for this town because that is what is missing. We have meetings and meetings and meetings and we never get anything accomplished. We need to accomplish something. We need to get the mill rate down. We need to do a lot of things that will bring businesses into town. Businesses will not come with a 40 mill rate. So unless this person can figure out a way to lower the mill rate and lower the taxes, we would be happy. Many of us can do things on our own. We don't need the town to support. And the people who do need support should get it, not the special interests. So I'm concerned that this per the person who you selected and paid well should do his job, get us the best person, and we'll commend you for it. And if not, you'll hear from us. Thank you. Thank you, Jim. Is there anyone else who'd like to speak? Mr. Kalish. Thank, Thank you for allowing me to address the uh, meeting. Uh, I'm not going to waste my time beating up on Mr. Kelly. However, I will mention the fact that uh, his subcommittee, which he was the chairman of, should have been more or less reviewed better by you people, the board, than was, i.e., you had your meetings at 7.30 in the morning. There's a lot of people that can't attend 7.30 in the morning. So automatically, you turned off the public. But I'm not, I'm not here to beat up on you. What I'm here to say is that it is my opinion that the candidate that's needed, you're asking for my opinion and my review, the candidate that's needed is a candidate that has all the degrees and then some. A candidate that has gone to college, has gone to grad school, has, go, has a doctorate, and these are the people you need. A people that's educated, has gone through all the system. Now, the reason I mentioned an educated person West Hartford went through a situation, and there's many of other towns that did. And they finally arrived at Barry Fellman. And it happened to be a good choice. It wasn't because his name was Barry Fellman. It was because he had the education, and he had the tools, and he had attended the schools. So he was well qualified to be a town manager. This is what you need. We don't need a manager that's jaded. We don't need a manager that's going to come to us jaded. Because my feeling is, if you select a jaded manager, uh, then we've lost everything. And I'm going to disagree with the proprietor from the Red Pub. This is the same individual that's complaining about the government that was given tax abatement after tax abatement after tax abatement. It's no secret the reason that the first selectman called him. The Red Pub is known. It's a democratic watering hole. They have their meetings there, and the various people are told to go there. People that have served on finance and other, when their people ask them, they advise them to hold their political or their meetings at the Red Pub. So automatically, you're complaining about the operation, but you're just as bad as the operation because you're, you're coming to the process jaded. You're not only jaded, in my opinion, politically, but you're jaded with the chamber. 
Chamber of Commerce. And if the Chamber of Commerce is so interested, why is it that they have to come to us for money? We just gave them $5,000. Was that a payoff? So getting back to what I'm trying is the, the process is not the way it should be presented. And the people should come in and give their opinion. If I had children that were attending school, I'd be here at this meeting. I don't see too many people. We're, we're about ready to take a venture into a big change in our way of governing. And look, this is what we have. I don't even think we have 20 people. And the other thing I'd like to mention, I feel that the approach you're taking, this board is taking, and the subcommittee is taking, you're out of your tort. The charter says that it's to be the newly elected chamber. I don't care if some people think they're, they're holdovers or they're going to come out from under the desk, but they're going to be elected by the people and they're to make the decision. Not you, Mr. Kelly. And you're not to put any, and there should be no influence on this appointment. It declared the charter recommendation and the people voted and the recommendation was it was to be the new board of selectmen and the new sel first selectmen. And incidentally, in all fairness, I'm a candidate running for first selectmen as an unaffiliated candidate. I, I, I should couch that in because I don't want anybody saying, well, you, you misled us. Because I feel a lot of the public is being misled on this new manager. Now, I was out among the public. I'm talking to people. <coughs> I'm a Jew. I just celebrated the Jewish New Year. And I attended. And people spoke to me and asked me about the new selectmen. They're Kelly. totally confused out there. Thank you. It's been over five minutes. We I'm can sorry, come, we yeah, can, we can but, come back uh, to you once other people have finished no, speaking I think, in this uh, period. I, I, I covered it, but uh, okay. Thank you. I think the uh, it shouldn't you. be jaded. It should be open, and it should be an educated, a well-educated person. Is there anyone else who would like to speak at public audience on the town manager selection process? Okay, seeing none, I will ask Mr. Jutton if you have any final comments, or are you good? No, thank you. <laughs> thank you for your efforts. And any members of the board before we close the hearing on this matter? On the process. Okay. With that, may I have a motion to close the public hearing? So, moved. second. Um, all in favor, please say aye. 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 We'll now begin our public audience portion of the Board of Selectmen. Um, I, as chair, it's my job to enforce the rules of the board as adopted. And this board has adopted rules permitting up to five minutes of public audience. Is there anyone who would like to change those rules? Okay, seeing none, those will be the rules that we apply. Is, is there anyone who would like to speak at public audience? This is on any topic. Ms. Dr. Rinaldi. I have. Mike Rinaldi from Pentecom Road. Recently there was a uh, conference <coughs> given um, a symposium on um, the state of Connecticut and why it's in trouble. There were three people who spoke. One was a lawyer, a bankruptcy lawyer. The second was a consultant to try to get people in and out of this problem. And the third was a lawyer who was interested in how governments are formed and how they work. One of the things uh, I didn't know was Connecticut is pretty unique. Out of 50 states, there are only two states that have government like Connecticut. I didn't know that. Most have either a county government or some form of government. We have 169 towns. It's the most inefficient way you can run a government. <clears throat> and then the question was, well, what's the other two? 
What's the other state? Well, what state did you really think of recently that almost went under? Rhode Island. So Connecticut is in huge trouble, huge trouble. It's, it's, it's pretty much bankrupt. They also stated during this conference that Connecticut taxpayers are the highest taxed in the United States. That's not a thing you'd like to be a part of. And when you tax them more, where do they go? They go to Florida. All those hedge funds guys, they, they took off, but the governor recognized he couldn't raise taxes anymore because he wasn't getting any more out of it. So Winston Churchill said, never let a good crisis go wasted. And we have a crisis. Town has a crisis. We don't do a good job at what we do. Board of Selectmen, over the past five years, three of those out of the past five or six years, they had a zero increase in, in their budget. And they were proud of it. They, but what they didn't tell the public, that they bonded 5% every year. So you had an increase in uh, CPI or inflation of 1.5, 1.7 during those years. Our budget's went up 5%. Then once there was a fellow named Willie Sutton, they asked him, why do you rob banks? He said, that's where the money is. Well, the money isn't in the Board of Education. The Board of uh, Select. Money's in the Board of Education. Board of Education has done a miserable job over the past 10 years. And they get away with it. Only one what reason they get away with it. Because we have an excellent school system. People praise it. You all, when you run for office, you praise it. <clears throat> but the fact of the matter is, they've been overspending a million dollars per year. The Board of Finance figured it out. They docked them a whole million bucks. Nothing happened to the school system. In fact, they gave every kid from 9 to 12 a computer. So what can we do? <clears throat> I'm talking to you, Mr. Kelly, because you're part of the problem with the Board of Education. You were there. You knew the data. And let me show you the data. If you didn't see these studies... Through the were... chair, please, Dr. Rinaldi. Pardon? Through the chair, please. Pardon? Through me, please. To you, yes. yes. The first study was a democratic study, long-range facilities planning, done by the, by the Board of Education. And they made recommendations, which weren't followed. The second was <clears throat> Simsbury Public Schools enrollment projection to 2021. We knew what was going to happen. We didn't do anything about it. We didn't redistrict which was the biggest thing we could have done. We didn't do it. And now we have a chance to do something really major. And that is put the sixth grade into the middle school. There's room. We don't need a study. The data is all pretty known. There's an academic study done by anybody you'd want to know who has credentials that the sixth grade configuration is the best. And the seventh and eighth grade configuration is not the best. In fact, the worst. What do we do? We know that from 1972, that in 1986, we went from 5,700 students to 3,800 students, and we closed the school. Thank you, Dr. Rinaldi. It's been five minutes. Um, I just wanted to let you, you don't know. Want, you don't want to learn about this I would problem. be very happy to meet with you. The problem is we're in trouble. You're giving me Thank five you. minutes to explain what no, the I'm problem gonna is. I'm going to give you hours. I'm happy to sit with you for hours. It won't do any good. The public has to know this, not you. So I do want to let folks know SCTV does let any member of the public film their own show, and you can do a show for a half an hour to an hour, and that's open, and it's absolutely free. So to the extent people want to share more with the public, um, that is an option. Anyone else for public audience? Ms. Coe. Joan Coe, 26 Whitcomb Drive. 
I would like to inform the Board of Selectmen that I had over a three-hour hearing on September 21st with the Freedom of Information Commission to determine whether the Simsbury Performing Arts Center, Inc., SPAC, is a public agency and the public should have public access to their files. While gathering information, I, research, I researched the Simsbury Performing Arts Center, Inc., at the Secretary of State website that was registered in 200, two, 2011 and continued through 2017. It stated that David Ryan was the president and Updike Kelly and Spellacy was the agent. Town attorney Di Crescenzo was a member of that law firm. Attorney Di Crescenzo developed the contract between the town and the SPAC 2013 and 2017 with a conflict of interest. Attorney for the Simsbury Performing Arts Center, Inc. at the Freedom of Information hearing was Attorney Houlihan. Attorney Houlihan has acted as a surrogate for town attorney Di Crescenzo when he was uh, known that the town attorney had a conflict as noted in the closing of Ethel Walker School property and light poles from Eversource on Iron Horse Boulevard. Attorney Houlihan was paid by the town thousands of dollars for his service. Is the town paying for Attorney Houlihan to represent the Simsbury Performing Arts Center, Inc. at the Freedom of Information hearing due to the town attorney's conflict of interest. Attorney Di Crescenzo did not enter this conflict in the town conflict of interest form. Attorney Di Crescenzo was present and participated in the Zoning Commission discussion and facilitated the text amendment to the zoning regulations, giving the SPAC the ability to provide a trailer park for the SPAC's three-day concert. Was town attorney Di Crescenzo working for the town or Simsbury Performing Arts Center, Inc.? Dave Ryan is the chairman of the Zoning Commission and recused himself from the discussion of the text amendment. However, Dave Ryan did not enter the SPAC as a conflict on his form. Has this conflict entered into several zoning discussions and votes based on merit or favoritism? These are serious ethical violations that the Board of Selectmen should review and file a complaint with the Board of Ethics against the town attorney and Dave Ryan. The conflict of town attorney Di Crescenzo, if known during the Zoning Commission meetings, could have changed the decision on the actions of the Zoning Commission. These allegations of conflict of interest with the town attorney is serious. I would like to have the Board of Selectmen sanction attorney Di Crescenzo and send a letter to the Attorney Grievance Committee to also sanction him as a result of the alleged violations. Does the Board of Selectmen condone this behavior? If not, file the complaints. There has been much discussion about the Simsbury Volunteer Ambulance Association. Other towns not able to get enough volunteers to drive the ambulances to medical calls, calls causing delay in response times. This prompted me to call Brandon Robertson, town manager of Avon, and ask him about Avon's response with their ambulances. Avon has AMR, a nationwide ambulance service that has a professional full-time staff with two ambulances. Avon does not pay for AMR. Avon had to provide a facility for the staff and the ambulance, which we already have. I was told that Avon, Avon has no complaints and response time uh, was, in, with, with, was within the guidelines. AMR is also in Farmington. Brandon Robertson reviews the reports that are submitted, and he considers AMR a very professional organization. I would like to have the town look into using AMR and no longer rely on volunteers that are not required to respond to calls. The Simsbury Police Department would act in the same capacity as they do now as first responders to all medical calls. I was very surprised when Mary Mitchell reported to my, uh, responded to my posting about Steve Mitchell asking First Selectman Lisa Evener for special treatment for an addition to his building plans for a drive through as part of the Volvo renovations. Steve Mitchell now has his mommy coming to the defense of his boorish behavior because the family is a longtime resident. Mary Mitchell has continually enabled Steve Mitchell to ignore the rules and regulations that impact the Simsbury community with a residence, residency litmus test. This is an unacceptable defense. I am pleased that the town is moving forward with the selection of the town manager. I would like to suggest that the town manager be required to live in the town and become an integral part of the community. Avon, Farmington, and Bloomfield require a town manager to reside in town. There could be stipulations for a person that presently lives out of town for a three-month time frame for residency. All my comments will be posted on Simsbury Patch, Twitter at Joan Co. 
news feed on Facebook, and Simsbury Forum topics, and I hope you take these allegations seriously and do something about it. This is absolutely a violation of our ethics law. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Kalishman. Thank you for allowing me to address the Board of Selectmen. The ethics of, uh, I am a candidate for, for Selectman for the town of Simsbury. So if you really want to change things, you could start with me. Now, I'm not going to go to length on this particular subject, but we had the monument down here, and there was money raised in the name and a grant issued by the state of Connecticut for veterans. The grant came in, and in due respect to the veterans, they raised their own money, but the grant came in, and uh, for some reason or other, the uh, Environmental, Environmental Protection Agency was to oversee this grant. And when I spoke to them, they said, well, uh, there's no way the town can have this grant to spend because it's their, their, they're not using their engineer. The engineer was being used by the people up in New Hampshire. So at the end, and I can produce the minutes if you push me to the wall, at the end, Mr. Cook stood up at one of the meetings and said, don't worry about it, I'll change the paperwork. But the people at Environmental Protection said, no, you can't change the paperwork because the town needs their own engineer. So they, what they did is they transpired, they put the money in the general fund, and uh, then they claimed, well, we have our own engineer, and they made a few changes over here, and that money to this day, I don't know where it is, but it's veterans' money. Now, the next thing, right, and I noticed that my representative is here. I ran for state representative, and my opponent, Mr. Hampton, he opposed me, and he was cited by the Election Enforcement Commission, him and the uh, state business uh, association, the CBIA, and they they signed a, a letter of intent, a letter of requisition, that they had committed it, and getting to the corruption that everybody's talking about, there's where a lot of it lies. And here we had a situation, I can produce the letter, if you doubt me, call the Election Enforcement Division, Mr. Hampton's here, he'll say that he, he signed the letter, and along with the CBIA. The next thing I want to go to, and I hope I certainly have enough time, is this thing that's atrocious. And it, they ran an article in the Times. And it's entirely different than what Mr. Shea told us. Mr. Shea told me at the meeting last, meet, last two weeks that they were going to tear down a wall and they were going to receive $41,000 from the federal government to do so. I read an article here, I find that all of a sudden we have a representative or state senator by the name of Betty Hudson that received $150,000 plus from this board and they bought the house. And if that wasn't a political payoff, I don't know what was. And you know, everybody looks chagrin and you look at me you know, the 5th Congressional District is, is corrupt. You don't think it's corrupt? John Rowland, where is he? 5th fifth, fifth Congressional District. You don't think it's corrupt? The Democratic Speaker of the House, Donovan, his whole staff went to prison, except Donovan. And he's lucky. And then along comes Governor Rowland, he gets another bite of the apple. And then let's not forget Lisa Wilson Foley, 
who just went to West Virginia to women's prison, and she just got out. So I want an investigation. And if you don't do it by yourself, and this ethics committee that we have is a joke, because I've been there already, and incidentally, the, the assistant chairman of the Democratic Party, he's the chairman or the vice chairman. You're not going to get a fair deal over there. So I want an investigation. And if you don't seem to go along with me, then I'm going to have to choose another remedy. Thank you, Mr. Kalshman. It's been over five minutes. Is there anyone else who would like to speak a public audience? Okay. Seeing none, we will close a uh, public audience section and move on to budget presentations. We have with us, and I want to um, thank both Senator Wickos and Representative Hampton for being here. It's been a harrowing and exhausting two weeks, probably. <laughs> Why don't you give year. us an update? <laughs> year, <laughs> months. Um, give us an update of sort of what happened, where we are, and where you see this going. Good evening, everyone. Thank you so much uh, for having Senator Wittkos and I here um, this evening. Um, there have been lots of uh, dramatic developments, obviously, in the last in the last week. Um, uh, the uh, budget impasse has been untenable, as you know, for our towns and um, our seniors and those with disabilities and our businesses and. Um, uh, last week, the Senate um, passed a budget, a bipartisan budget, um, that ultimately came to the House, um, which I supported with my vote, a bipartisan budget, um, for several reasons. Um, that it doesn't increase taxes, that makes Simsbury's um, town whole and its schools whole, um, does not shift teacher pensions onto the town. Um, fully funds uh, uh, day programs and employment programs for those with disabilities, uh, protects program for care for kids, SAGA, uh, mental health programs, uh, provides more stability for our business community, um, and uh, most critically, um, as was mentioned earlier, we are in a crisis mode, and unfortunately the state over the years has operated on a crisis to crisis basis. And what is in this budget that is important to me um, are structural reforms that include a spending cap, um, a bonding cap, um, and also addressing some of our pension issues uh, moving forward. Um, it was really important that we push through a budget before the October 1 deadline, which we all know is fast approaching. Um, the governor has promised to veto this budget. Uh, in the meantime, a, a lot of us have been meeting um, with our leadership. Um, some of us who voted for this budget on the moderate Democratic side met with the governor last week to address some of our concerns. Um, so uh, hopefully we can end the impasse and um, we can certainly answer questions or misnomers that you have about the budget. Um, and certainly glad to be here to present and, and be here with Senator Whitco. So I'll turn it over to you. Thanks. So you kind of know where we've been uh, and where we're going. So we're in the phase where we're trying to miscorrect uh, the misinformation that's being spelled out there about uh, the budget closing uh, regional campuses at UConn and closing the health center at UConn, uh, how we're decimating um, uh, programs uh, throughout the state of Connecticut, how uh, the earned income tax folks are, are hardest hit population, the folks that are working uh, that are below the poverty level, how they're taking the biggest point. Well, that, that's all false. And so we have a budget. Folks, people keep saying to us, you guys need to pass a budget in Connecticut. We have a budget. It was passed, as John said, on a bipartisan basis. So our goal is to try to make sure that we can get the governor to sign the budget. He has said he's going to veto it as he still continues to go through uh, the budget to, to fully understand and vet it. Um, we're trying to convince our colleagues if he vetoes it to over. <coughs> Where I think we're going, um, this week, Thursday or Friday, we will probably go back into session to do one bill and one bill only. There will be an agreement. Uh, I think tomorrow, part of the leaders leadership meeting tomorrow with the governor at 1230. Um, we're all going to sign off, I think, the leaders, that it will be the only bill that we do, and it's the hospital tax bill. It increases the 
uh, amount of taxes paid by our hospitals funnels through, but it actually puts guidelines in so the governor can't keep the money uh, himself. The hospital association has signed off on the bill. They're okay with it. Um, and we need to do that before October 1st because the way it's billed, it goes back to the previous quarter. And then once October 1 hits, if we don't have that law signed into place, then we we'll lose those uh, tens of millions of dollars of reimbursement from the federal government side. So uh, there's been an agreement amongst all the parties, and I think tomorrow we'll just finalize it to make sure that no amendments will be run on the bill. It's going to be a clean bill just on the hospital tax and to go from there. Um, Internally, uh, I understand that there's some movement and agreement on some of the things we have in the bipartisan budget that folks are coming around on, that being a, a version of a spending cap, uh, a bond cap. Those are very encouraging. Uh, the governor's kind of drawing a line in the sand of where he wants to go with the uh, pension obligation reforms. He believes that uh, it's not legal what the budget attempts to do, as you recall in the news media that the uh, CBAC agreement was until 2022. Uh, this new CBAC agreement extended it by an additional five years. So in 2027, there will no longer be a CBAC agreement, State Employee Bargaining Agent Coalition, which is health care and, and pension plans. And so the budget that was passed put implemented things statutorily that says you'll go up to an 8% uh, employee contribution on your pension plan, et cetera. It, has, it takes it out of collective bargaining and makes it into statute. And that we would be <coughs> by 47 other states. There's only three states now that do it the way we do it. Uh, so obviously we're on the wrong side of that coin. We should join the rest of America and say these types of, uh, of health care and pension benefits should be done uh, statutorily. Uh, we are relying on an opinion by the Attorney General's office. Uh, Attorney General Jepson said, yes, we're on sound footing for that. So we feel very confident that we can uh, pass those types of um, legislation. We don't know where everybody is. So we're still trying to close the gap. Uh, but this budget is really multi, multi-dimensional. Uh, and it doesn't just hit school education. I know that's one of the biggest dollars everybody's concerned about. But on October 1, the school's looking at getting 20% of the payment that they would normally get. Your biggest chunk of payment on the Board of Education side comes in May. So unless you're financially strapped, Hartford, for example, you should be able to manage the money for a little while longer, out of however you, you have to do reserves or move money around. But Hartford uh, is in a very uh, dire situation. I met today with some uh, two bond insurer groups, guarantors, that said they own combined 60% of the bonded indebtedness in Hartford. And they are trying to meet with all the interested parties and say, what can we do? And so it was a pretty good discussion. Um, and we've engaged Mayor Brown, and I think he was surprised that the budget that was passed out of the General Assembly was not the one that he thought was going to pass. Uh, so he quickly reached out, so we, can we have a conversation, please? So that conversation is ongoing. In this budget uh, that both John and I supported, there was an additional $22 million in Hartford, uh, earmarked for Hartford. I know the mayor is looking for $47 million, um, but we need to have a conversation. There's going to be strings attached because there's some things that we believe that uh, government should, be, should not be involved in owning um, – baseball stadiums, owning um, XL centers, things like that. That's something that the city should not own. They should sell or, and do away with that, get that out of the out of thing. Because they're losing money uh, left and right on those types of things. So those are the types of things that we're looking at. Uh, tomorrow at 1230, the leaders meeting with the governor. We'll kind of see where we're going to go. We're not going to have a budget in place by October 1. We will not. We're just going to have the hospital bill uh, done, and then we'll move forward from there. And I think. The governor had met with the Democrats last week, met with us separately, and now this is the first time since the budget passed that all of us are getting together in the room. We'll kind of get an idea of where we are. And, you know, we're looking at a new strategy that we think uh, will help out uh, move the budget negotiations forward. We're waiting on some legal advice to see if it's something that we can do. It's kind of out of the box thinking, and we're going to be presenting that tomorrow if we have our decision back. So I can't really divulge it yet tonight, but hopefully we can get. Uh, to a remedy quick, but we're not going to pass something that is harmful later on. We've got to have these structural changes now, otherwise we're going to be back here again having the same discussion, you know, two years from now. A question. We were at the uh, cost presentation with uh, Keith Fanhoff of CT Mira, and he indicated through his analysis that both the Democrat and Republican budget within two years have a $3 billion gap. Is e any budget that is passed, will there include a I know you can't address it 
in this short of time, but will there be a plan to address it in that budget? Some sort of, are you going to work with the consultant, the experts, best and brightest? What's the plan? Because we're just going to be back here in two years doing the same thing if we don't start planning for it now. I think some of those structural changes will get us there. We recognize that there's a deficit in the third year out. Well, we're not budgeting for that. Uh, it's, it's reduced from what uh, the original bill was. Um, we're not going to be able to fix it in one cycle. It's going to be a multiple year cycle, but we'll get there. Because we think what we do in this structure changes will help us grow the economy so there'll be more revenue. So do you have an idea? There are two ways that this can progress. You can take the democratic budget and include some of the structural changes and some of the cuts that the Republican budget had, or you can take the Republican budget and include some of the uh, items of great concern in the democratic budget and the Republican. Do you have a sense yet which way this is going to go? Well, I, I think the way it's going to go is that the budget that passed the General Assembly would be the starting point. Hopefully it's start of compromise. There was stuff in the Democratic budget that was in the Republican budget. Um, reducing the earned income tax was actually in the Democratic budget. Um, there was a bond cap in the Democratic budget. There was a lot of, of not a lot, but several parts of the Democratic budget in the, uh, the final budget that we passed last week. But we really want a bipartisan, uh, and I think our, our constituents and our state really wants to, to get past the partisan politics and um, have to come to consensus and really revitalize our state and give you all some assurances and predictability because um, we're far past the point of, uh, of uh, doing anything else. Thank you. I'll open it up to questions from the board. I just want to address the 8% contribution to pensions. I feel it's disingenuous to call that a no tax increase as long as that increased contribution to the pension is not going to the historically underfunded pension fund. It is going to the general fund. That is a tax on our teachers and public employees. That is not, unless that contrib increased contribution is going to the pension fund, which we all know has been underfunded for so long, that's a tax. That is not a no tax increase budget. As is, if, if expenses are being passed on to municipalities, that is also not a no tax increase. I'm sure if you ask anyone in, in the room if their property taxes go up, that is not a no tax increase budget. And so I just feel that those two items need to be looked at with honesty. Uh, the 8 percent increase, if it's going to the general fund, that's a tax. So that's one of the reasons why we're out here explaining the budget, because the information that uh, that is a tax is is false. I don't think uh, folks have the Is it going to the general fund, or is it not? I could finish. Okay. Um, but what what uh, Sletman Lang is talking about is a contribution that the teachers make to their pension plan, and that is governed under the state statute. And currently, they pay 6 percent of their salary into a pension plan, which pension fund which is managed by the Teachers Retirement Board. Under the budget that was passed, that increased 1% a year over the biennium, so it would be 7% in the first year and then 8% in the second year. Uh, statutorily, we can't dictate where that money goes, so a letter was sent to the Teachers Retirement Board and the Office of Policy Management, and that letter says it is the intent of the legislature that if the governor signs this budget bill, then the additional 2% shall go into the Teachers Retirement Board for the pension fund. So we can't control that statutory. That's why it's not in there. But a letter was sent. We have a copy. I can send it to Lisa, and she can just distribute it to the board. That we don't want that money to go into the general fund. That is solely used for to help fund the teachers' uh, pension plan. And that should be received. At, if you're a teacher, you want to get a contact the teachers' retirement board. They should have that on file as well. But I'll, I'll be glad to send a copy of the letter over. Thanks. Yeah. Any other questions? All right. It's, it's, it's unusually so, quiet. Stay tuned, I guess. Yeah. We'll be back again. Well, we d first of all, I do want to thank you both for keeping us so well informed. It has been a crazy uh, situation, and any time I email or call you guys, you always pick up the phone. I'm very appreciative of the responsiveness and your willingness to understand the concerns of this is So thank you for that. Sure. And thank you. let's get it done, guys. <laughs> thank you. Thanks, thanks thank for serving, Senator. Okay. Uh, we'll then go on to mailbox policy, which we're going to do rapid fire in three minutes because I'm very tempted to table this tonight because we're running a little late. But we did want the point. That's why we're doing it to the. We noticed there was no plowing today.
But we did want to make the point that now is the time to check your mailboxes, and if you can move it, it's not ready for winter. But why don't you tell us what the policy is? Yeah, I tell you, I just don't want to be looking forward to winter right now. Uh, can you just jump, jump real quick to the next two slides? Um, long and short of it, uh, when it comes to snow plowing, the worst thing that we have to deal with is mailbox. Everybody has a mailbox. We've all been there. Um, and, and really the question is, why do mailboxes fail? The other day as we were actually driving around as part of our solar site tour, I'm picking off mailboxes that are lean and that are crooked, that you can tell have served their owners well for 30 years of time. <laughs> this is the weekend. Go down to the local hardware store, buy a new post, get it in while the weather's good. Because what happens when you're plowing snow, especially in some of the big storms we had last year, where with the snowfall rates that we were seeing and the limited number of trucks that we have on the road, by the time a plow truck gets to your neighborhood, there might be nine or 10 inches of snow on the roadway. The plow is 11 feet long, and that truck is moving every last inch of snow in front of that off to the right-hand side. There's nowhere else for it to go. And the deeper the snow, the much more force. The other thing that has a huge impact, because I've had people say, I lived out west for years. I never had a mailbox damage. It's the same reason everybody wants to go out west to ski. It's light, <laughs> fluffy snow. We can have four inches of snow followed by a little drizzling rain, and the next day the phone just light up with mailbox issues. And, and I've been in, in the passenger seat of the truck and watching essentially enormous snowballs roll right off and take out mailboxes. And, and it is frustrating, and um, it is not anything that anybody in my department takes lightly. They take a lot of pride in their work, and unfortunately, it, it feels as a very negative to them when people are frustrated and they think that for some reason they're doing it on purpose. Um, Cheryl, I know you went out last winter. She, she rode in the plow in the blizzards. Um, and you know, we did not hit a mailbox. Has ridden in, in, yeah, Cheryl did not drive. <laughs> <laughs> and no not point did mailbox. she take <laughs> My mailbox yeah. got taken out. I was blaming her. <laughs> yeah. She did ask you exactly where you live. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, it was Sean. Oh, yeah, there was <laughs> yours. I'm sorry. She's got forgot. a little damage on the front end. But, yeah. Yeah. Uh, we, keep, we keep an eye on, on the drivers. We have, um, with our own work order system, we can, we can map and see where we have mailbox complaints and issues. Quite frankly, when we went through last year and, and did an inventory of it, it was the drivers who had the most houses on the runs had the most reported strikes. Um, realistically, probably one in ten phone calls that we get are actually struck by the plow. Um, the vast majority of the mailboxes failed due to the force of the snow and slush. And that. We also have a few strange circumstances every year where the mailbox was physically struck by a truck, but it wasn't our truck. It was the person <laughs> plowing the driveway across the street who came out too quickly. Mm -hmm and knocked it over. In fact, you said and I were together and <laughs> saw a particular mailbox of concern that was knocked over. We were able to see the track. It was clearly not from a big truck. Fortunately, the owner came out and met us at the end of the street and said, yeah, the guy who was plowing my neighbor said that he did it. Oftentimes, those people don't necessarily raise their hand and fess up. Um, poor mailbox design. Believe me, in our department, we look at a lot of mailboxes. There are a lot of mailboxes that are very expensive, and just because you're paying a lot of money does not mean that it's going to hold up to the um, force of our New England winters, rotten, old, and previously damaged boxes. As you drive around in the next few days, look at how many mailboxes have been damaged year after year after year, and they're screwed together, and they're bolted together again at a certain point in time to replace them. Uh, and there are those ones where it is directly hit by the plow. Uh, we do our best not to have that happen, but again, with long hours, blinding snowstorms, occasionally they do catch one with the plow, and when they do, it leaves a very clear indication. We have our guidance document, and if you have ever called our office to ask about a mailbox, on the, included in the package along with the Board of Selectmen policy, you will also get a copy of our proper installation. We ask for nine inches between the face of the curve and the edge of the grass and the mailbox. Um, again, there's some large mailbox companies that do a lot of installs in town where they are six inches to hanging over the curb. It, it just, you're not giving yourself a good chance. That nine inches is fine for our post office. They can reach out and get you your mail. It, it really does reduce the pressure. Um, current policy, as set by the Board of Selectmen uh, a number of years ago, is $25 for a mailbox, $25 for a post that was directly impacted by the plow. Um, according to the policy, no mailbox will be repaired or replaced if the damage caused by the force of the snow and slush and anything else coming off the plow. And the first select person is authorized to interpret this policy and make reasonable decisions. Next one, please. When we go out, after we, we get the, the call, everybody says, well, how do you know if it was hit or not? Um, we look for paint marks on the mailbox. The orange paint on those plows will come off and, and leave a very clear mark. It will leave a, a, a sharp crease. If you come out and look at our plows, they are very large, and they are steel. 
They're not flexible, they're not soft, there's no soft edges. When it hits something, it's going to leave a clear indication. Um, we also look at the edge of the snow in relation to the mailbox. We can see how close the plow was or was not during that storm. Um, whenever possible, whether we hit it or not, we have somebody out there. We've equipped that person with a bucket of screws and a screwdriver, and planks of wood, and everything we can because if they can spend five or ten minutes and get somebody's mailbox back in service, I know that makes a huge difference to the homeowner. It made a huge difference to me a couple years ago when I came home in the middle of a snowstorm and found my mailbox was down. My first question was from my wife was, how are we going to get mail tomorrow? I'm going, you know, I'm really tired. I've been working for two days. <laughs> We're, we, we, we understand our residents, we really want to make their lives better, and we've gotten a lot of thank yous in response to doing that service. Um, after we do our investigation, we write a letter, and it either says, it was hit by the plow, and, and here's your, your, your check will be coming. If it's not, we're able to fix it as a courtesy, or if it's not, and unfortunately that day we were not able to fix it. In some cases, there may not be enough left to put it back together. Um, just thought I would show a couple real sad pictures of mailboxes. Um, this one is a great example, though. You can see by looking at that white box, um, there's no dents, there's no dings, there's no paint transfer. Slow down, Sorry. Speed. Slow down. I know we're trying to do this. Um, but, that, but that's one of the, one, the ways that we would look to make a determination. Any day now, Liz. Any day, please. <laughs> this is an example of a post that has just been rotten. It was actually held together with a piece of signpost. I don't know where they got a piece of our signpost. <laughs> and literally, the person asked over and over, well, why can't you put it back together? I'm like, there is just nothing left. It is crumbling in your hands. <laughs> and in these cases, and this person was particularly difficult, and they had some other challenges associated with, with um, the winter, we do have a few temporary mailboxes, which I mean, these are ugly. I'm going to promise you, they're, they're on a metal stanchion that's an old tire rim, but we can put it up and we can make sure that we do get mail. Um, we don't bring those out every day, but again, this was a family that had some particular challenges and, and we put that out and uh, it was out there for a good long time until they, they, they got themselves a new mailbox. Next one, please. Um, just as a quick comparison, some of our neighboring towns, and we do a lot of comparisons uh, regularly. Avon is 25 um, for the box, 65 for the post. Bloomfield is 25 and 50. Granby is, and they left themselves open, the cost of a standard aluminum box and a pressure treated post. Um, I can tell you, you can go to your favorite large box store and get a mailbox in the $20 range. Post, pressure treated post, I just looked it up today, is um, $25. That is not necessarily the post that many of us would be happy with here in Tinsbury. It's a 4x4 four four post, plain Jane, nothing exciting. Um, Cheshire is up to $200 with receipts. Um, a lot of paperwork involved in that. Um, Farmington, they will go out and actually put in a 4x4 four four pressure treated post for you. They didn't for me. They, when, when, when I let them know at the conference that they had happened to knock mine over, um, they laughed at me. <laughs> I suggested we were going to do driver training that summer. Uh, Weatherfield was 15 for the box and 25 for the post. Go uh, the next one, Melissa. Like I said, we took a quick look today just to make sure that. You, you can replace it. I realize a lot of people in town have a much more decorative mailbox. Uh, this is, again, very plain Jane pricing, and, and we've been that for a while. I will tell you, with the price being relatively low, when in doubt, we'll pay it if that's going to make a resident happy. If we can't tell, or you know, in some cases, there is no box left to look for paint marks, it, it, it's low enough that we've been able to have a level of flexibility. Um, a little copy of an email I got. I said, Tom, what a delightful surprise to find a mailbox magically fixed as we dug out this morning. Many thanks to everybody for the bitter cold, and they were actually appreciative. And there is my mailbox from a couple years ago. After it was knocked down, I reconstructed it with Ethan. Ethan is now 13, taller than his mother, almost as tall as me. And he's going to hate is you for putting this picture up like that. I put that, up, that, on, right? I put that up on Facebook last year. It's one of our early Facebook posts. So. Yeah, I've been there too. My mailbox has gotten knocked over. That's a pretty heavy duty one. I'm hoping I get a few more years out of it. <laughs> so, one question I have for this board, and we won't make a decision tonight because it's not under action item, but if anyone of this member wants to change the policy, the price point, or anything, if you could please let our office know, then we can do a submission uh, for consideration. But I did want to bring this up, otherwise, it will be the policy as it exists today. And I want to thank Tom and his staff who actually, I mean, people think those trucks are going fast, but when you're in it and you're looking at the speedometer, it's not that fast. It just feels fast because they're so big and loud. 
So I think if you haven't done a ride along in one of our plow trucks, I really rec if you're 18 and older, I recommend you doing it because once you get in there, it's a whole literally a whole different perspective. Oh, yeah. Absolutely. So oh, yeah. And I joked about my mailbox being taken out, but it was actually the snow and it took the flag off the side, which made the post office upset. <coughs> but my actual mailbox was not hit by a plow. Office, in the interest right. of full disclosure, <laughs> um, but I and overwhelmingly. I hear from people how great the public works people have been with handling this and other issues. So, and it is frustrating. We get that, but you know, we live in New England, guys, and we're gonna, <laughs> <laughs> you know, we, we can't change the weather. I mean, we do our best and um, I, and try and do a fair thing. But if anyone does want to change the price point or any mm -hmm. matter of the um, policy, please let our office know, and we'll put together a submission on that. If you could go directly through Tom, so that we don't violate FOIA. Uh, that would be helpful. Okay, great. All right. Moving on to the Simsbury Fall Harvest Food Drive. I see Representative Hampton has left. <laughs> this is his submission to allow for the use of Town Hall parking lot located at 933 Hot Meadow Street for a harvest food drive collection in support of the Simsbury Food Closet. That would be on Sunday, October 8th. May I have a motion? So moved. To approve. Yes. Um, may second. I have a second. Any further discussion? All in favor, please say aye. 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 The motion carries unanimously. Item A, approved tax refunds. May I have a motion to approve tax refunds in the amount of $9,586.36? So moved. Second. Any further discussion? All in favor, please say aye. 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 And next, it is with great pleasure that I have. Um, the opportunity to introduce Kristen Formanek as our new Community and Social Services Director pending the board's formal appointment. This um, Formanek went through a rather extensive interview process. Um, a lot of people participated in it, I think, because that reflects how important this position is for the community. Um, she will replace our current Social Services Director, Mickey Lefort's Beck, who we wish every good wish to as we go forward. And um, I just wanted to say that Kristen comes to us from the town of East Windsor, where since 2014 she has served as the Director of Social Services. Prior to that, Kristen served as the Coordinator of Social Services for the town of Windsor for seven years, and she has served as a, the, a Social Services Consultant, a Social Worker, and Activities of Daily Living Counselor, working with individuals with developmental disabilities. And she's also held leadership um, positions throughout the state. So, Kristen, if you could come up and uh, let us congratulate you and thank you mm -hmm. and welcome you to the community. I know Kristen was actually at the Senior Center earlier today. Yes. Thank you. Good evening and thank you for having me tonight. Um, as Lisa said, I'm Kristen Formanek and I'm your new Director of Community and Social Services. Um, and I am genuinely excited and honored to be afforded this position. Um, I'm looking forward to joining the town of Simsbury. And as you have read and heard, I do bring to you a wealth of experience and a passion for public service. Um, I am licensed by the state of Connecticut as a social worker, and I have over 10 years of experience working as a leader in municipal settings. Um, as you've heard, I did work previously with the town of Windsor, where I began my journey as a municipal leader, and now am leaving the town of East Windsor, where um, I've uh, had more experience and have enjoyed working with the um, Senior Center and with Human Services with the Town of East Windsor. And personally, I am a resident of the Town of East Granby, um, so this is very close to me and um, will be a good commute and easy for me to be here for you whenever I'm needed. Um, I would like to take the opportunity to ride in one of the snow plows. <laughs> <laughs> um, when I'm home, I enjoy spending time with my two teenage daughters. Um, sometimes enjoyment is loose spinning in that scenario. <laughs> <laughs> they are in eighth and ninth grade, respectively. Um, I'm also an avid equestrian, and the three of us can usually be found at the barn where we lease two horses. 
Um, tonight, I had the privilege of touring the community center, meeting some of the staff and several of the seniors, and um, also immediately donned an apron and served pizza to the seniors as they were waiting for their bingo game to start tonight. Um, so that was a real fun experience and got to begin meeting people and seeing um, what my next leg of my journey will be like. Um, I look forward to being here and learning about the town and the services, and I'll be starting full time on Monday the 2nd. Uh, thank you for having me tonight, and um, I'm looking forward to getting to know each one of you, and if you have any questions for me, um, I will be here next week to answer them for you. Cheryl, you. Cheryl you had the pleasure of serving I on did. the search committee. Is there anything you want to add? Well, I just want to say welcome to Simsbury. Um, we are very fortunate to have you here with us. Um, it was a, a rigorous process that you went through, and um, you rose above the other candidate. We are, we are thrilled that you are here. Um, and I personally am really looking forward to working with you on the various committees and projects, and I think there are only good things ahead for that. Thank you. <laughs> I appreciate that. Does anyone else have anything they want to say? Welcome. <laughs> Thank Welcome. you. Thank you. They have a motion to approve the appointment of Kristen Formanek as Community and Social Service Director for the Town of Simsbury. So moved. Second. Any further discussion? All in favor, please say aye. 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 Do we have the town clerk here, or has she left? Okay. So we will, have, we will have to do the formal swearing in, if you could just make an appointment with the town clerk, and um, that'll make it super official, but we are, we are pleased to welcome you <laughs> welcome to the town. Anyway. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. And you are welcome to stay, but if you want to go home, that's yeah, okay. Yeah. <laughs> when we give you an easy run. <laughs> as, as those two said teenagers are anxiously awaiting my return, I will no. take my return. <laughs> Understood. Oh, they, Congratulations. Right, right. No, I don't believe you have teenagers anymore. Mine would be like, stay out. <laughs> don't come home. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks, Thanks a lot burning the house down. I know. Salary. Okay. Can we, can we please, um, can we, we publish all salaries. Um, we now move on to item C, approve the fiscal year 17 budget transfers and supplemental appropriations. Uh, we are not going to be closing capital projects because we, our auditors, we not, were not able to conclude their evaluations. We expect to do that in October, but we will do the transfers today. I want to thank Sean for your work on this. Um, before, um, let me get to that. I'm very happy to report, and I realized that I forgot to do my first selectman's report, so I will come back to that. Sean, Sean's after, been waiting. After the action <laughs> item. Get my mouth episode. shut. I know. Good, good, good luck. But um, we are very excited to let the public know that we will be returning a net. 106,191 back to the general fund and like to thank our town department heads and staff who work diligently as they always do to deliver uh, quality services in the most cost effective manner and they knew during this last year and now again this year how difficult um, the budget is and how much uncertainty is there so I do want to give credit to department heads and staff who really work hard for the town of Sunspray and Sean if you want to walk us through what we're doing tonight that would sure. be wonderful Sure, um, and I'll try to be brief. I think if we start with the agenda submission form itself, um, in fact, the reverse page, um, we'll show you the uh, final results kind of in the same format you've seen throughout the year as I've updated you um, by department. Um, again, consistent with prior years, um, and as you all know, through our budget process, uh, which is kind of now a year-round uh, thing, apparently, uh, but we have um, a number of different budget units, so to speak, and so multiple departments or a department uh, such as, say, police is actually made up of uh, three budget units, one being police, one being animal control, one being civil fairness. So um, out of an abundance of caution to make sure we comply with the charter, what I end up doing as an interdepartment transfer, um, which has to be recommended by you and approved by the Board of Finance, is to go ahead and roll them all up by budget unit. Um, so you see that on page 14, actually, of the uh, legal page. You'll see the full kind of resulting. Uh, but what you're actually doing tonight is approving, um, well, both recommending that, but also approving intra department transfers uh, that, again, make an individual budget unit um, whole, so to speak, um, if they were slightly under in one line but over in another. Um, that's what those transfers um, take care of. Um, part of, if I go back quickly to that agenda submission form, what, uh, as Lisa said, uh, we had a <clears throat> actually a, a fully favorable year on just the Board of Selectmen operating budget. Uh, $218,958. Uh, 
What um, I'm proposing tonight are two additional transfers. One, a small uh, transfer of eleven thousand and nine dollars to um, the debt service line, and then also, as we updated at the la or the August meeting that I attended, the Simsbury Farms uh, deficit this year um, actually totaled one hundred twenty-four dollars, one hundred twenty-four thousand one hundred forty-three dollars. I'm not sure that. Uh, mm -hmm. Now, um, this year, Simsbury Farms opened with a twenty-two thousand dollars. Positive fund balance, uh, so the actual transfer needed to make them whole is the hundred and one uh, hundred and one thousand seven hundred fifty-seven dollars. So um, all that's by way of saying we are able to cover Simsbury Farms within actually the general fund operating budget without having to go to reserves as we have I think, in some years past. Um, but nonetheless, so actually let me if it's not there. We just hand out Simsbury Farms. Just so you have the overall roll up is that over and above the 90 we already gave them it is over and above the 90 we already gave them, yes <clears throat> so they're net a buck 91 that's correct well uh 124 plus what if we took the 90 away 124 plus 90 so they're actually over 214 right yeah. so that's a substantial operating deficit that's actually increased that from correct. the prior couple of years yeah, and you'll notice on the form I just handed out, they um, were actually able to stay under budget uh, from an expenditure standpoint. Um, the problem was squarely on the revenue side. Yep. Um, they finished $32,000 under budget, um, but $156,000 off of the revenue target. That is, in some degrees, a, a, a product of rain. It actually was a very rainy season, and when they start their things, unfortunately, when you have a program system of revenue that's dependent on how many people go there if you have a lot of rain it can really be uh, very difficult to meet your numbers and that was a large part of it uh, was there any other no I mean it is that and as always we, we say this every year it's a it's, it is partly a function of timing uh, as well because they had a favorable June uh, which actually helped them be positive last year um, July and August last year were rainier than usual um, and that carried forward to a to a long and, and wet winter and spring. Um, they didn't really get going until later this year. So those, uh, you know, with golf, a two or three weeks here or there can make, um, you know, a fifty or $60,000 difference depending on the weeks so, and the weekends versus weekdays. But um, as I said at our August meeting, I'm, I'm sure uh, we'll be, I believe, uh, Mike and Sean and, and we'll be reconvening re 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 the uh, mm. Secretary Farms uh, Special Revenue Committee. I was hoping we could do that. Yeah. I was too. Um, <coughs> that seems to be a So, um, question though yeah. on that, um, that still preserves their separate line item for the dollar per round. That is special correct. revenue right. fund. So this is um, completely separate from that. It is okay. still housed in the special revenue fund. But yes, uh, and they do have a positive uh, fund balance of that. Okay. Um, Good. For the equipment fund. Okay. <clears throat> Thank you. Sure. Any other questions on the general fund? Uh, so you're going to need two motions from us, one for the uh, within department transfers and one from between department transfers. That's what we've done in the past. I'm happy to um, have this as a PDF. I'm just going to end it to the minutes. One option would be to, to do a motion to say uh, approving the intra-department transfers. Those are the ones that by charter stay at your level. And then recommending the inter-department uh, transfers as outlined in this attachment, perhaps. So I would recommend that we do two motions just in case there's it and since one goes directly to the board of finance one requires mm -hmm. a, a subsequent motion by the board of finance so why don't we do intra which is between within the departments that just requires board of selectment approval so may i have a motion for intra department transfers mm -hmm. so moved. second any further discussion all in favor please say aye aye, aye. aye. I have a motion for inter-department transfers, and those are between departments that require a recommendation from this board to the Board of Finance. So moved. Second. Any further discussion? All in favor, please say aye. 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 The motion carries unanimously. And Kathy, if you could please append uh, the document that Sean referenced to the motions, that would be helpful. All right. Any other questions for Sean? Thanks, Sean. Okay. Thanks. Thank you. Moving on to item D, uh, purchase of a Bobcat.
compact track loader. It's sort of an interesting situation. As you know, our procurement policy requires us to go out to bid, and we can use national or state bids to do those bids for us. And we, I'm going to let Tom describe it, but before the board was a, a request to purchase a Bobcat compact track loader at the value of 68788 which was budgeted through the budget process. Sinsbury's procurement process requires bids for items of this price point. The Director of Public Works used the National Joint Power Association, which is a competitively bid process. And this comes before the board, ironically, because the Public Works is requesting a purchase outside the bid price from NJPA because the price he is proposing is less than the bid price. <laughs> oh, did I forget to do that? I I thought it was after it. I think it's after it was. Yeah. Well, I, I think we had it before, but I think we can assume that this. <laughs> we'll go ahead and do that. Thank you for the reminder. We'll do the Kerma next. And it's, okay. I think, I think Lisa, you hit nail on the head. Um, NJPA has generally been reliable for our large equipment purchases to be uh, very cost effective. Um, Kevin Clemens, our highway superintendent, who was procuring this piece of equipment, took the extra step to call around to our local um, Bobcat dealer. Um, they happen to have the piece of equipment we need in stock, so they don't have to ship it anywhere. When you're talking about moving this size piece of equipment, that is really the nuts and bolts of why we're talking about $3,451 <laughs> savings. So kudos so to Kevin and, and yeah. everybody. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Right. <laughs> Permission yeah. to save money. Yeah. 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 Did we have a motion? Did someone yeah, make Yeah, Sean moved. I seconded. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Any further questions? All in favor, please say aye. 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 I the thought motion. that one was going to be more difficult. <laughs> Yeah, we hate saving money. Uh, uh, saving money is an easy uh, low pitch. There you go. Um, what we have before us is a motion to authorize the first select woman to submit a grant application for the Kerma Excellent and Risk Management Award grant uh, for the Department of Public Works. Uh, because it is an application for a grant, it does require Board of Selection approval, but there is no financial impact other than the Department of Public Works may gain some extra money to put towards risk management. So. Do you want to talk us through that? Um, I tell you, there's another reason one. Um, <laughs> Kerma has actually, um, they, they have, um, in order to kind of promote their risk management, they, they, they put out this Excellence in uh, Risk Management Award this year. There's actually four subcategories. Um, I think we may try and put it together actually two applications to kind of, you know, hedge our bets. Um, looking at some of the work that the department has done, I think this fits exactly into what one of our core goals has been, which is we truly believe in safety. Um, we are above and beyond, I think, what a lot of other municipalities do. We've worked directly with OSHA. Um, we have bought equipment and we use equipment that other departments don't have because it's the right thing to do. And it's really, for me, it's out of respect for the, the people who are working for us. And they deserve to be safe. And as we started putting the list together, I was rather surprised because you forget about all these small things you do. And some of the small things are the things that I'm actually excited about. Like when you come out for the snowplow ride along and walk into our shop, we paint it on the floor in front of the electrical boxes and in front of the fire extinguishers not to block the area. Silly little things that just put in everybody's mind all day long that safety matters. Uh, we worked with Connecticut OSHA a couple years back because one of our employees was concerned that when we put the flags up on the flagpoles that the scaffolding that's mounted to the back of the truck is not OSHA compliant. We said, you know what, there's only one way to find out. And we called Con OSHA. We worked with them. The only thing they asked is that we mount a seatbelt and that we have a better written policy than we did and that we just documented our training. And it just builds that trust, um, I think, between our employees and us when we do the right things. Okay. All right, with that, may I have a motion to authorize the first select woman to submit a grant application for the Kerma Excellence and Risk Management Award grant for the Department of Public Works? So moved. Second. Any further discussion? All in favor, please say aye. 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 The motion carries unanimously, and we'll have um, Tom, stay here because we have the next item is yours as well, and it is a motion to authorize the first select woman to execute a solar power purchase agreement. Um, as you know, Tom has mentioned that he was in the process of looking for those with the Clean Energy Task Force. And before the board is a request to authorize the first select woman to execute the necessary agreements with our selected solar developers, Asante Energy and Lodestar Energy LLC and their partners, Eversource Energy and the CT Green Bank, to allow for the installation of rooftop-mounted solar PV arrays at the Department of Public Works campus on Town Forest Road and at the skating rink at Simsbury Farms. Um, 
as part of a power purchase agreement, one for each side for a term of 20 years. The financial impact, the first year of savings at Department of Public Works and Simsbury Farms will be about respectively 13,546 and 21,160. And over the life of these two projects, the town is estimated to save over 1.1 million. Currently, we are buying electricity at 18 cents per kilowatt hour, and this will allow us to purchase at 9 cents per kilowatt hour, so almost cutting it in half. We, the, any motion that we make on this will be subject to uh, review and approval by council. Because it is a complicated document, and they are working on other solar things right now. <laughs> it, 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 it's, um, with the so solar power purchase agreement, it is um, a number of different documents that are required. Um, and this is a program that the state has offered for a number of years. It's called their ZREC program. Uh, zero emission renewable energy credit program and we actually applied for this oh, seven or eight years ago with a group of projects including I believe Tooten Hill schools um, the public works facility and the um, WPCA and actually my intern at the time Melissa was actually <laughs> helping us at, at that time um, and unfortunately at that point the Z-Rex were paying so little that there were some communities willing to have solar panels on the roof and buy the electricity for the same price that they would be buying it at the street and I kind of smiled that we introduced our new social services director, and it reminded me of when I first came here to be introduced so many years ago. Um, <laughs> and that we talked about green energy and the fact that I do believe in green energy, but only when it makes sense on both sides of the aisle. It needs to make sense on the financial end as well as the environmental end. Z-Rex have come a long way. Less towns are, are applying for them. This may be the last year that they even offer them. And we would be applying for the public works facility would be what's called a small Z-Rex. So we know exactly what we're getting going in. And it basically is a first come, first serve. So we're anxious to move this project forward to make sure there's still slots available for us. The skating rink would be what's called a medium Z rec, where it would go to a, effectively a competitive negotiation or competitive auction, where our vendors would be saying, this is the price that we would need to have paid for these renewable energy credits in order to offer this rate to the town of Simsbury. Um, I think we have a very good project. I think it's very probable that we would be selected for the skating rink. Um, but just due to the size, it falls into that different category. Um, the other thing is I did hand out to you um, a memo from Hill Energy Services. Hill Energy is a company that we've been using for about eight or nine years. They help us when we do all of our um, electrical purchasing, our fuel procurement. It's what they do every day. Um, they're very conservative. We ask them to look through this to make sure that our review was accurate. And when you get into the nitty gritty of some of the details, they did ask me to revise our savings numbers down just in terms of being ultra conservative. Um, and I can provide an update to the memo, but um, long and short of it, in the first year at DPW, instead of 13,500, they're looking at 11,200. And first year at Simsbury Farms, they're looking at 18,900 in savings. But we're savings in, in year one, and the electricity that we're buying through our, our, our process is going to stay fixed for 20 years. So each and every year, unless something changes dramatically, electricity rates are going to be going up. We're going to be buying the kilowatts produced on our roofs for less money. Um, we are also going to have, Jerry Toner is going to be presenting this to Parks and Rec because this would be something that you would be visible at the um, Simsbury Farms on the skating center roof. Um, the nice thing about this array is that it would be a complete rectangular array. There'd be no missing panels. There's no sections where there's vent pipes or anything else coming up. It would fit the entire frame of that building because even with all of those panels, it still will not produce as much energy as that facility makes. It is also interesting that we'd be using the sun to make ice. But is this um, <laughs> proposal, should we amend our agenda to make it uh, subject to approval by Cultural Parks and Rec and Review? I, I think that would be, be wise, okay. yes. Um, can I just ask a question before yeah. I get to that part? Um, who owns the panels? They would own the panels. We're simply leasing them the space on a roof to put the panels, and we are agreeing to buy all of their electricity. They are 100% responsible for all of the maintenance. Mm -hmm. And at the end of the contract, at our option, we can either ask them to leave them or we can ask them to take them away. Mm -hmm. They're fully responsible for making sure the roofs don't leak. Mm -hmm. That's key for us. Um, in fact, they were so concerned about the new roof at the, w, uh, at the public works facility that they wanted to put it on our other building. So, and included in that, within the contract, is the ability that through the 20 years, if we have to re-roof, they have to take their panels off, give us adequate time to re-roof, and then they put their panels back at no penalty. Um, I had this discussion with uh, the Housing Authority, yep. and um, part of what came up was one of your suggestions, which I appreciated, was to explore the warranty options on the roofing 
because they only do this type of array on roofs that are under 10 years old and you know yes most of them still have warranties attached to them so i assume we have considered all of that we, with we have the, considered uh, that <laughs> in both all of the roofs that would be um would have the panels mounted are standing seam metal roofs so mm -hmm. it's an ideal candidate where they have clips they're already built to, to to make these connections and it's not as if it's a built-up asphalt roof and we're cutting holes or so no penetration yeah. okay um, well that explains that okay shape. and is there a um any funds available for the removal at the end of the 20 years they would be responsible for the removal or we can have them keep it it's our, our choice at this point in time i would think at the end of 20 years we'd still want them but mm -hmm. if we ch chose differently other people other than all of us maybe melissa <coughs> right. would be here to, to say maybe we still want them but um well just technology changes and, technology and that's changes. a long time for same technology thing, al for along the way if they um if some huge breakthrough in solar technology came out um, the way the plans are written, I believe they have the ability to um, modify the array, and we have then the option of purchasing the additional energy or not. Um, that's critical more for the skating rink, where we can use more electricity right. than, than the current array could generate. At the public works facility, for the meters that are going to be connected, um, it will do 100% of our power, and it's being sized accordingly. Can excess be credited back or the excess is sold on the grid? Within a given year, due to virtual net metering, any excess would be sold off to the grid. The problem is when we sell energy to the grid, we get wholesale pricing, which is in the range of three cents per kilowatt hour, right. not the kind of money we're paying. So that's why we want to size it appropriately. Right, exactly. Thank you. Any other uh, questions? One other thing I think that is important on this, I know we've had a lot of discussions on solar this year. Um, this, to me, I think is the solar that a lot of people have wanted. It's going to be... Um, on roofs serving the facilities that it's on certainly yeah you can see the function and the the actual production are right yes, there I, I forgot to mention we have mark Scully <laughs> here with our clean energy task force i know they've been encouraging us to do this for a number of years so oh i agree no i think it's great we'll go to sean so what happens if this company goes out of business there are provisions in the contract um long and short of it somebody would take it over or we would take it over but i don't i don't have all of the specifics on exactly how that how that would work um, what I would tell you is that the value of the array is there and it's and it's a good value so if <laughs> presumably we've got some recovery because they're on our roofs and they can't get on our roofs without our permission so. that is correct yeah <clears throat> makes sense okay. the, the Green Bank is a state of Connecticut yeah. uh, that is correct in the in um, well, that might go out of business too <laughs> The, the, the interesting thing is the reason that we're going with two different solar developers is when we received the proposals, we narrowed the field down to three. We did interviews. We narrowed it down to the two firms we like best and asked them to submit revised proposals with the more detailed cost estimates. One was cheaper at the DPW and the other was cheaper at the um, skating rink. And we told them up front, we're going to go with whatever combination works best for us. Yeah. So. Okay. Thanks. May I please have a motion to authorize the first select woman to execute the necessary agreements with our selected solar developers, Asante Energy and Lodestar Energy LLC, and their partners, Eversource Energy and the Connecticut Green Bank, to allow the installation of a rooftop mounted solar PV arrays at the DPW ca campus on Town Forest Road and at the skating rink at Sinsbury Farms to be part of a pair of power purchase agreements, one for each site, with a term for 20 years, subject to approval by council and subject to the approval of Culture Parks and Rec for the uh, for the solar panels at the rink at Simsbury Farms. So moved. Second. Any further discussion? All in favor, please say aye. 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 <coughs> Motion carries unanimously. Before we get to Jamie and the update, I'm going to do a quick first select loans report. There you go, Sean. Um, I did point out, I did change my notice to uh, Sinsbury taxpayers and included a link to a legacy of debt, Connecticut standing on its own fiscal cliff, which gives an excellent summary of how the state of Connecticut got to the place where it is, and I do encourage members of the public to read that. And I did add a sentence that um, whatever budget is passed, we strongly encourage it to address the $3 billion deficit that we know is coming two years from now, and let's not continue to just rearrange the deck chairs. It's time to find long-term solutions. Uh, again, very pleased to announce to the public that the town of Simsbury will be returning over $100,000 to the general fund. I want to wish a very fond farewell to Mickey LaCour's back. We had the pleasure of meeting the new community social services director, but Mickey 
served our community faithfully and expertly for 37 years. Vicki consistently went above and beyond what was expected of her to help the citizens of Simsbury in need to have the essentials of life such as food and a safe place to live. Mickey expertly ran and operated the town shelter during the October 2011 storm and during other storms. She served on the Aging and Disability Commission, the Community for Care, the Health and Welfare Commission, the Human Relations Commission, the Juvenile Review Board, the Public Safety Subcommittee, the Youth Services Advisory Board, the Welfare Committee, as well as, as the town's veteran service contact person. As you can see, she had a well-lived life and we will miss her dearly. Um, I wanted to let folks know that you can discover your vet veterans, veterans benefits on September 27th at 5.30 p.m. at the Simsbury Library. Jason Coppola, a veteran service officer from the State of Connecticut Department of Veterans Affairs, will be discussing veterans benefits, topics of interest to veterans at the Simsbury Library, and that will be in program room two. There will be a community forum on opioid addiction on September 28th from 6 to 8 p.m. at the Simsbury Library. I'm pleased to announce that Simsbury Farms was awarded the Farmington Valley's favorite golf course by the Farmington Valley Visitors Association. Uh, there will be a program on the first witch hanging. One, it's called One of Windsor, The Untold Story of America's First Witch Hanging on October 10th at the Simsbury Library from 1 to 3 p.m. Let folks know that the LGBTQ plus history, trivia, and dinner event is on October 24th. The renter rebates program is still uh, going on. Real estate revaluation of real estate in Simsbury continues. I did want to point out that the First Selectman's Report does have a page listing the voting locations that are being changed during the next election. And I do ask everyone to please take a look at that. Uh, residents on those street addresses will get a card indicating that their voting location has changed. There will be signs at the end of the neighborhood letting folks know that their voting location has been changed. There will be a press communication uh, initiative that goes out to let folks know. But anything we can do to let folks know that, please help us get that word out. And the survey for town managers is still out there. So if you haven't had yet a chance to do that, please do so. We do have a number of wonderful ribbon cuttings coming up, and they are included in my first lessons report, and ask folks to take a look at that and join us for that. Um, I asked Jamie to come because, as you know, last time we talked a little bit about the Amazon, Amazon RFP uh, process and our conversations with regional partners in that area. We did submit some sites. Obviously, we can't host 50,000 mm -hmm. people in Amazon, but we would be a great location for our research and development site as part of a community and so we did submit a few sites as we were asked and Jamie's going to talk about that. I do want to say the likelihood of Connecticut getting it and us being a part of it is not great but it was a great opportunity for us to do sort of a fire drill and we really saw some of the deficiencies at the state level and what we would need to do if something like this comes up again and so it was interesting to reach out to some of our businesses who met the qualifications that they were looking for and I'll ask Jamie just to talk about that a little bit and what we submitted Metro Hartford was the coordinating group for the Hartford area so we submitted it to them thank you Lisa just quick kind of review of the time frame that uh, on or about the week of September 10th uh, Amazon announced a nationwide search kind of a be, depending on which newspaper you read, a lottery, kind of Willy Wonka and the Chocolate Factory kind of proposal, that uh, they were relocating a new HQ2 headquarters uh, to parallel and rival their existing holdings in Seattle. They were looking for initial take of 500,000 square feet of office space uh, that was available within the first six to 12 months of their selecting community, and then upwards of 8 million square feet in total office space. Uh, we probably started to sit down around the, four, the 13th. On the 14th, we had a meeting that Lisa hosted here with Hartford Metro and other members of our surrounding communities. You have a copy of the spreadsheet that uh, staff prepared, primarily myself as the author, to try and make sense of the RFP that was in this uh, voluminous number of pages and how you would evaluate the criteria both in and there are some of the towns that we had some initial discussions with such as Bloomfield, East Granby, Hartford, Simsbury, Windsor also speaking with the Metro Alliance, Capital Region Council of Governments as well as 
um, a few other places Hartford in the there. state of Connecticut. And Hartford. Was and there. Hartford was, yeah. if I skipped over Hartford, I apologize. Bloomfield, East Granbury, Hartford, Simsbury, yeah. Windsor, Metro Alliance, as well as a CROG and the state. And we tried to look at how we amass all this information to give to the Metro Alliance, who can give it to DECD at the state level, so that the state of Connecticut can put a proposal together. So we kind of sat down and evaluated what does Simsbury have as assets? What did we have as an asset? Perhaps a 600,000 square foot former office complex that is still 100 acres of vacant land right now. And we looked at other larger holdings along the Route 10 corridor, and we looked at who owns them, what their availability is, are they willing partners, and how much could we fit there. And also zoning, the current as zoning. As well as zoning. So was it PAD approved? Was it form-based code? Was it zoned industrial? So where were we? So we started on the southern part of town at the Avon town line and headed in a northerly direction. Um, after amassing this and, and discussing it at the, the local level and internally, we came up with four sites. We started with the Greenberg property, which is the old Eversource building. And then we headed north to the Hartford property, which is 100 acres, the Hartford South, not the Hartford North. That was home to a 600,000 square foot office complex that there were some plans to expand that to well over a million square feet. There was already a plan posed for 4,000 parking spaces. There were 3,000 on site. So that kind of came extremely obvious. Then as we headed further north, we looked at the availability of land at Powder Forest. That's a pad-based development, and we reached out to EB Realty <coughs> and spoke with them. And then we looked at facilities in the immediate downtown area, such as the state lots. And from there, we prepared four kind of dossiers on those properties. We contacted all of the owners, and we reached out for their agreement, which we have uh, emails on their agreement to put their properties forward and develop the map and the potential square footages that could fit there. And I would try and go along with the first selectman's woman's comments that we really don't think that we can fit 50, 000, uh, 8 million square feet in town. No one on, on my side in the planning and development office is looking to fit 8 million square feet in town because I'm not sure how we would get 50,000 people uh, to town in an AM commute uh, without mass transit. And I'm not sure how a lot of cities are going to move another 50,000 people in an AM commute without a walkable scenario. So again, we put those together. We submitted those to the Metro Alliance on the 19th. We got confirmation on the 20th that they have received those, and we're really in a holding pattern right now. So Metro Alliance to DECD, DECD, we believe, will be putting one proposal together for the entire state of Connecticut to submit to Amazon. But really, we viewed this as a dry run to sort of what happens when something like this comes in, and we were really unprepared, the whole state. So everybody had to scramble and sort of figure it out. Now we know that we can do this a little bit more systematically and expand it because we're not going to get it. I, I, guys, I'm sorry, we are not getting Amazon, probably in Simsbury. But what it did is open our eyes to how we should prepare for the future. So if something comes in, we should know what properties are available and have a list. And, you know, obviously this was a list that met Amazon's criteria, but there are other things out there, and we should mm -hmm. really start to manage mm -hmm. our lists and work partner with our businesses so that we know what's out there. If someone says, can I go here? Um, and so I thought it was a good dry run. It was a good dry run for the state of Connecticut, which was woefully unprepared. Um, there were other states that had things in their door. They literally just took it out and handed it to them. We, we do not. Um, I think, you know, the, the great thing about Connecticut is we have people who can pull things together very quickly, and I have no doubt that the submission will be a good one uh, at the end of the day, but it really shows that there is some work to be done. And the, and, and the thing that we found inspiring, talking with our neighbors in the Hartford region, is how much this region has to offer if we think about it regionally. Mm -hmm. Obviously, we couldn't be the center. Hartford has some areas where they could put it. But Amazon pointed out, well, we're looking for nice places for people to live with great outdoor activities. Mm -hmm. and. Right, and if, if Hartford sells some of the towns that offer the amenities that Hartford itself doesn't have, or if we sell some of the amenities that Hartford has, they had a bigger space that could do a 
campus that Sinsbury never in a million years could. We start thinking about that and how we complement each other and that and and to tell you the truth, that this ends up in anywhere in Connecticut, the whole state of Connecticut benefits no matter where that is. So we all tried to get on that same bus that this let's not be parochially about this. We want it in Connecticut period. We don't care where in Connecticut, let's put our best foot foot for it because we're all gonna benefit it as a state something like that comes. So it was sort of an interesting fire drill. And I think it will spark some discussions going into the future. So we looked at it more as a, you know, emergency <laughs> operations test. Yeah. And I would say fire drill is actually a, probably a little selling ourselves short. I mean, this may not be our thing, but having worked in the Pacific Northwest in the mid 90s and the first wave of internet business, the values of these companies that now dominate the online sector, they want to live in a town that has access to outdoor recreation, right. cultural resources, good schools, existing educated populace. What does Simsbury have? Right. All of these things. So this, this actually is very important for us to do, and it's more than a fire drill. It's actually a view of the kind of economic development that keeps our quality of life high, but also really suits us I think well. over the long term that's true, but this was totally a fire. Oh, no. <laughs> we had to do this but, very But it, it sounds too uh, temporary. <laughs> no, I, mean, no, no, I, no. I mean, it's more a dry run of what's ahead of yes, us exactly. than a fire drill. Exactly. It Again, the, the mindset, too, was to put Connecticut in perspective with the rest of the country, that if San Diego County is putting a proposal together, Connecticut is a little bit but larger already than the West San West. Diego County, but, but, not if, much. but by not much. So let's not look at this in a parochial nature of 169 municipalities where Bloomfield's competing against Simsbury and Simsbury's competing against Hartford and East Hartford, that if the Hartford region, or as you said, stated, Connecticut mm -hmm. lands part of this being located between New York's Metro and Boston, you know, 50,000 people need to be hired. Mm -hmm. So there aren't 50,000 graduates coming out of school that can hit the ground running. So someone has to go into a labor market that is already existing and that they can, in essence, raid. Um, and New England is potentially ripe for that, mm -hmm. so both at the college level from the professors or the MITs mm -hmm. who are writing logarithms for these companies could become employees of these companies. So, and it was also, I think, good for DECD to sort of see the assets of the surrounding towns, because they had never actually ever pulled together the assets in one location, and to get it in several documents that pointed out, hey, if you complement these qualities that this town has with these qualities that this town has, suddenly you've got a very attractive package. And that was, I think, eye-opening for a DECD, and, for, and it was a good exercise regardless of the ultimate result. It really. I think sort of set a path for that we can take as a state and, and I think Jamie is exactly right we are the size of some cities so let's start thinking that way and think about our assets that we can offer um, for some counties in any event maybe not cities but Wait, yeah. just one question the, the fact that um, Amazon recently built a very large facility up in Windsor and and the relationships they built does that help not help was is that a factor at all was there anything learned in that we had certain relationships that have been built with some of the development teams that were more than willing to reach out to amazon given their relationships but the difficulty is you know we have a few centers in mm -hmm. connecticut other states have six nine eleven you know and again and that you get a look at the parochial nature of connecticut versus massachusetts versus new york and new hampshire and vermont you know, California is the equivalent of Maryland to Maine. So if it lands in that vicinity, you know, the region wins. Um, California would like to land in second headquarters. You know, I think, you know, my sense is they want to be on East Coast, West Coast, or at least have some separation distance from a natural disaster standpoint, from a political standpoint, from a tax structure standpoint, and from an employment standpoint. They need to get into a different labor market. Um, and it's going to be interesting. You know, I want to be Charlie on Willy Wonka. <laughs> <laughs> I feel certain that we are. <laughs> I'm, I'm there opening candy bars with you, Jamie. We're, we're I don't even like yeah. chocolate. Sorry. You know, but they're a heavily capitalized yeah. <laughs> company. Do they need heavy incentives? You know, 
someone's going to throw them potential very large carrot. If you look at what what Massachusetts put together for GE, uh, there's a Samsung manufacturing plant going in at almost three billion dollars worth of incentives for twelve thousand jobs. Three billion, twelve thousand x versus fifty. What's the number? So Axios did one of the blogs did put out a thing in there saying the number is probably about ten billion. So we know the state of Connecticut. So. I mean, but Jamie's right. Sometimes you do look for more than just that. And if you run the numbers in terms of the revenue that it brings in, you have to do the cost-benefit analysis as to whether it makes sense or not. A mm -hmm. state with an income tax, it could be just $400 million based on income tax on salaries. Mm -hmm. you know, so $400 million a year, 10 years, that's, for, you know, that's a lot of money. Someone could just say, I'm going to incentivize the income from that, never mind the, the X factor of all the companies who will chase that facility mm -hmm. on the spin-off. So, if anybody has any questions, I'm always available for you if you have any questions. Again, as Lisa had said, this was a good opportunity for both internally to look at, you know, I mentioned we have four jackets now for four properties in the community. Uh, we should, probably should build upon that. Yeah, and that's something we can do over time and work with our business community to build it because, you know, we go larger to smaller. It's, and, it was an interesting, I thought it was an interesting exercise regardless of what happens. It was interesting because a lot of the towns had to work quickly together who don't normally work together. So that was fascinating in and of itself. I can take a moment to thank my staff for letting me disappear for three days to put all the information <laughs> together in a very timely manner um, on a very tight time frame. It was, it was, it was crazy, but it was interesting to watch. And I do want to commend uh, Jamie because I think he really gave the framework, at least for our area, that was used by Metro Hartford Alliance and how to analyze the... Uh, <laughs> the spreadsheet that we prepared was the one that was sent out. That's great. Yeah. Thank you. It really is Good great. Job. Thank you very much for stepping up. Yeah, so thank you. And to your staff as well who supported it. And also to Sarah at uh, Sinsbury Main Street who helped us mm -hmm. coordinate the project and to Mr. Cook and uh, Two Melissa. Two people to my left. Yes. <laughs> it was a real, it was <laughs> totally top. nuts. And to Joanne who helped host the meeting, <laughs> oh, <yeah. laughs> which was no small feat as well. Um, thank you. Thank you, Jamie. Going on to appointments and resignations, uh, com may I have a motion to acknowledge the resignation with our great and dear thanks to Kathleen Coffey as a regular member of the Housing Authority, effective September 14, 2017. So moved. Second. And can I just add that she will be dearly missed by the Housing Authority. Yes. <laughs> All in favor, please say aye. 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 The motion carries unanimously. May I have a motion to appoint Amy Musk as a representative of Sinsbury High School to the Community for Care Committee? So moved. Second. Any further discussion? All in favor, please say aye. 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 The motion carries unanimously. I'd like to welcome Amy. She will be a great resource to the so uh, committee. Um, we are going to table the appointment of Jennifer Whitman as we have not received the submission. I believe this is an open spot from the town Democrats as we understand it. There was no submission, so we cannot yet do an appointment. I think there was a headcount issue on that committee. So. Yeah, so they they just they're just working with the town clerk to figure out the mechanics of that. Um, and certainly want to thank Jennifer Whitman for her willingness to volunteer, and hopefully we can make this happen in at our next meeting. So just a few mechanics that need to be worked through. Figuring out, don't want to overstep how many people we appoint to. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, then going on, we have the regular meeting minutes of September 11th, 2017, and the special meeting of September 15th, 2017. I'll give folks a little bit of time to review those. And then if there's a motion that anyone would like to make to uh, any adjustments to the minutes, please let me know. Otherwise, they will stand as final. Everyone can please take a look. anyone have any changes they want to make at this point? Okay, those minutes will stand as final. We'll move on to selectman liaison and subcommittee reports. So we'll start with personnel. Chris, did you have anything to add beyond what we did at the beginning of the meeting? Well, we do actually, and it is rela uh, in relation to um, a recommendation of the Board of Selectmen uh, relative to the residency requirement. Uh, if you remember when we originally posted the advertisement for the position, uh, we had a discussion as to whether with that posting we would state that there's a residency requirement or not. Mm -hmm. The personnel subcommittee had recommended to this board 
that we not have a residency requirement with the um, um, posting of the position. At that point, primarily so that the um, requirement would not be a disincentive for people who live within commuting distance of Simsbury, who would be very good candidates, uh, to not apply. Mm -hmm. um, at that time, that was really an informal recommendation that we all coalesced around as a group and agreed to. We did discuss it as a board with the understanding that we would come back and have a more formal recommendation and a more formal decision on it. Uh, we have had an opportunity to discuss it further, and our recommendation is to not have a residency requirement, really for two reasons. Uh, the primary reason is that you can take a look at high-performing municipal employees in Simsbury and other communities, and there are many that live within their community, and there are many that live outside of their community that you can look at someone who lives within a community as, yes, having a unique insight into what goes on in that community. If uh, they utilize town services, they clearly have an insight into town services as someone who outside of the community wouldn't have. To the same extent, in the context of continuous improvement and decision making, someone who lives outside of a community has a different perspective from their experiences in other places. They're experiencing services in a different community. They can bring you know, the best of practices that they see outside of the community to their work within the community. At the end of the day, what we identified is that we really could not state that living within the community is a bona fide occupational requirement that is an absolute necessity for a high performing town manager. So for that reason, that's uh, issue number one. Issue number two is we do feel that we would continue to have potentially a disincentive for what might be top level candidates who would withdraw from the process if we had a residency requirement. And so that issue also still stands with us. This individual, and it is within the job description, is going to need to be able to access Simsbury very quickly in the case of wanting to help respond to an emergency. So these are not individuals that per our process can live you know, hundreds of miles away. Uh, but we believe that this recommendation, first of all, is most consistent with what's truly required requirements for excellence. And secondly, we think uh, generates the best pool of candidates for us. And so with that, we actually want to have a formal adoption by this board you know, of that decision. Um, and we feel the timing is correct because we're now at a point where we're beginning to enter the more extensive discussions with the candidates, and so what we'd like to do is, is uh, formally close this issue out. Do we have any consideration been given to the amount of time that the subcommittee feels appropriate to get to Town Hall? I can tell you things come up, and I need to get to the office very quickly. Um, certainly in an emergency, you saw that actually routes were not accessible, hmm. and so being able to get to town uh, was I mean, what distance is okay? Is an hour commute okay? Is an hour? We have some of our staff who do an hour commute. Is that okay? Does should it be within a uh, distance level, or should it be within a time level for which they can get there? To me, that's very important. Although, and you can certainly call in, but if communications go down, which we saw them that happen, the ability to get to town is not inconsequential. Although it doesn't happen that often, but when it does, it, it is. Crucial. Um, so that's my only concern about that. I do appreciate the idea that you don't necessarily have to live in town and you might lower the pool. I know that our superintendent does not uh, live in town. Our yeah. public works director or right. you know, the people who have to be here in a hurry. So we felt that um, we didn't want to limit ourselves. We did not have a very high quality candidate available to us. Um, because they lived in East Granby, you know, as we saw tonight, you know, we have a very high quality candidate who's going to be our new community and social services director. Um, again, a position that requires you to be here in case of an emergency. So I think we hesitate to put a limit, you know, by saying you have to be within 50 miles or whatever, you it know. It would certainly impact our decision making. If it would could impact decision making. Within it closer could, than yeah. the shoreline. That it could might. be a factor, you know, that, yeah. you know, certainly. Is, do you th is there any value to putting language in the description maybe strongly encouraged if we're looking at a candidate that is going to be relocating and they're looking at communities nearby that they should prioritize 
Simsbury or neighboring? Is there any value to putting that language in? We, we talked about that. I mean, yeah. we think we're one of the best towns, if not the best town, so I don't think we need to put that language in there. We've already made the case that this is a, a phenomenal place to live. Well, if, if somebody's re and relocating from afar <coughs> and they choose somewhere else, it makes me wonder why. Well, <laughs> it, yeah, <laughs> why, why did they choose to take the job? Sure. But there's, you know, there's financial issues, there's family issues, there's right. second job issues. You know, it's more yeah. than just one person here. The, you know, the the one income family re you know, really doesn't exist. Right. I, I just would in, look in at a, an a family that has kids already, say, in Granby schools. Yep. Right. I would we look would. at that differently than someone moving exactly. from Boston and they oh. look at some in Granby and pick Granby. Yeah. Yeah. We right. heard from our consultant that 90% of his placements have a working spouse. Mm -hmm. So um, having a spouse who has a job that has to be lo relocated or changed is also a factor. And that is a big decision-making factor for those candidates who are considering that type of right. a move. But to live closer to another area to commute to means that you're taking, you know, like our ECS point person further from town, which I think well, just no, to Lisa's the, point. The, the, the director of emergency management is in charge downstairs when the EOC is opened. The first select person would obviously is a member of that, but. No, actually the first select woman is in charge no. and assigns the EOC. Yeah, they serve at the pleasure of the first select woman. In that room, yeah. Kevin Kowalski is in charge. But we can debate that at another point. But we're also, yeah. Um, point being is is that we don't apply an arbitrary mileage distance to Tom Roy. We don't apply one to the, the, to the senior center coordinator. I mean, she's gonna be responsible for our, our shelters. And but currently, you know, with our elected CEO under our current system, the boundaries of the town kind of keep our point person nearby. If we have an emergency that makes travel difficult, will our point person be able to get here? We got these. Yeah, I'm, I'm not well, against. I'm not. I'm not against the recommendation of looking to try to quantify. I mean. I mean, if we're making the statement that one of the expectations is that they can access Simsbury, I'm not against a further conversation on quantifying that. It's not something that we can respond to tonight. It's something that we as a board can dis discuss mm -hmm. further. You know, Elaine, we did talk about the concept of preferred <clears throat> but not required, you know, which is uh, an approach that we could have taken. For me personally, if we're, I like, if we're saying that it's not a bona fide occupational requirement, then I prefer that to be just a clear, pure statement that that's what we believe. And then additionally, the assessment from Don is most people who are going to be moving from a distance are going to move into Simsbury. Mm -hmm. And secondly, some of the best candidates within Connecticut have already indicated to him that they would move to Simsbury. Right. Um, this is something that we can explore with individuals, get a, it, it, get a sense as to what their thinking is. Um, but the reason why I personally was more comfortable with just a pure dec dec statement that that it's not required versus preferred is to me it's just the purest statement that's most consistent with it's really not a critical success factor mm -hmm. for the individual. Correct. And, and going back to the superintendent of schools, we actually we've had two recent we have two superintendents. The current one who doesn't live in Simsbury lives in Ellington and the previous one who lived within Simsbury, both highly regarded within town, very well regarded within the state. I worked with both of them, and both of them have had a value-added perspective based upon where they lived. I think Diane had a value-added added perspective because her kids went through the school system, which gave her an insight, but Matt also talks about the value of seeing his kids in a different school system having different experiences and seeing the best practices of that school and that informs him relative to the work that he does. The other example I use is when we went through a significant transition with what was a dysfunctional police department back in the late 80s to the early 90s and one of the things that was very clear to me is that we had police officers that lived within Simsbury and that provided some unique insight into things that go on in town, but sometimes they lost perspective and had relationships in town that tainted their perspective. So on, on one side, good, on one side, not good. And at the same time, we had police officers that lived outside of Simsbury and they had, a, a more, they had an objective perspective. They had a best practice from other communities. So on the downside, not as good as an insight into Simsbury. On the upside, a much better insight into best practices. So at, at the end of the day, if you really believe in the spirit 
of bona fide occupational requirements, it doesn't, to us, rise to the level of being a, an absolute statement of requirement for a best-in-class in town manager, and hence the reason that we used the proposal that we did. Well, and I, and I, I can also see there's more potential for conflicts of interest if you have someone living in town in that position, which I'm sensitive to. But I also think um, one thing, at least in the midday session today, that Don said multiple times was the importance of welcoming the town manager and his or her whole family into the community. And if they are not living in the community, that becomes very different. And he seemed to underline that as important to the success of our town manager as a holistic kind of approach to ensuring that success. So. I, I don't know that I ha feel very strongly one way or the other, but I do see some strong reasons in both ends. So that's not helpful, but there you mm -hmm. go. Actually, that's how, exactly how I feel. There are some strong reasons to have the residency, but there are some strong reasons mm -hmm. not to. Um, I think, you know, there is something to self governance being among the community that you are governing. Uh, that is kind of fundamental to our. American democracy. But on the other hand, I do certainly understand that this is more a professional position as opposed to, well, I think I'll just stop there. <laughs> I think there's pros and cons to both sides. Um, I think just that we're talking it through last night, I've heard a couple points that I hadn't thought about or looked at. And uh, I think there are two very strong points. For, to be in town or not be in town. The perspective mm -hmm. you get from those two viewpoints can can be helpful at times, can be a challenge at times. Mm -hmm. um, I'm not ready to, to decide on this tonight. I really want to think it through some more. Okay. Uh, unless everybody else is all set to go. I think we need to be prepared to move on this because we can't leave this as ambiguous for okay. the candidates that are out there. So if it's not okay. tonight, it needs to be soon. Because uh, candidly, if I was applying for this job, I would want to know yeah. already. Okay. I mean, we've already <coughs> narrowed down our field, you know, by more than half. And right. if we are going to begin to ask people, you know, to come in for that final uh, review process before the interviews, I think it's only fair to the candidates to tell them whether we're going to require them to live here. Personally, looking at the pile of, of <laughs> Resumes, I would have a preference towards those who would be w either willing to live here or v in one of our immediate neighboring. Well, areas. And that's certainly something we can discuss with each candidate. Um, but whether or not that is an absolute requirement is, you know, better. No, I'm just, yeah. you know, I just think that's where my chips lie. So I, I would, so are we, do we feel we're in a position that we could vote at the next meeting? Cheryl, do you feel that's too late or? Well, um, it's a week before the interviews. Yeah. yeah. I mean, well, we're supposed to be interviewing on the 19th. And I think if, you know, we really have to, just to be fair to the people, if we're going to call somebody in for an interview who now lives in Illinois, you know, that's a lot of travel and other things, arrangements to be made. If they, they're they're moving. Clearly yeah, moving. well, and yeah. at that point, if I'm you're gonna not going to pick yeah. here yeah. to live, you know. So, but. so let me make a motion, and and you know, let me approach it this way. I think if you're on the fence, that's actually a statement that reinforces it's not an actual requirement, mm -hmm. and uh, subsequently supports the motion. If it's someone who either lives in Simsbury or it's okay for them to be in a neighboring community, I think that statement also reinforces. The proposal that we have. So, with that said, I'll make a motion that we do not have a residency requirement uh, for the town manager hire. Second. Second. Um, I'll just say that, um, first of all, I thank the subcommittee for your efforts on this and all the members of the public who participated in this, in the search. There is something sad about not having the leader of this community live in the community. Um, I am willing to forego that. I will not be on this board to make that decision. And if it's the sense of the board that this is the way you want to go, I will absolutely support it. I think you know you will have an opportunity to vote on it um, when it comes. And to Elaine's point, we know that it will be a factor that weighs on her 
mind for consideration of a candidate. But there may be a situation where someone is wonderful and there are family circumstances that don't permit them to be in town, uh, recognizing that families do have multiple commitments. So I am, I am okay with it since that is the sense of this committee, but I do find it strange not to have the chief executive officer living in the town to which he is accountable or her. You're right, and I mean, I appreciate that, that, and that's why I think we've taken so much time thinking about it, you know, growing up here. I mean, that is something that's that's important to me too, Lisa, and, and, and I do appreciate where you're coming from, and it, it does feel a bit strange. You know, it, I don't know if it makes anybody feel any better, but this isn't the last time that this board or future boards are going to talk about job description and requirements and candidacy, because this won't be our only town manager, right? Well, it might be if we were to change the government back, but that's that's unlikely in the short term. So if we find we get it wrong, this that's what this body is there for, to, for oversight. And we're not going to get this 100% perfect. Um, but I think that we're doing a really thoughtful, thorough review um, based on our own experience, based on talking with people in this community, based on the individuals that we have on staff, and based on the, the really intelligent consultant that we hired. So I, I feel comfortable that we're, we've done our due diligence and this is the right decision at this point in time, but we can certainly look at it again in the future. And all of our elected people will live in town. Correct. That is, that is guaranteed. <laughs> that so, change. you know, that can't change. So well, who you elect well, will live in town. To that point, that. you know, but Elaine, actually, that, that's a good point is that you know, I I know it feels like we're, we're giving up our leadership position, but we're not. We're still going to have a first selectman, and we're going to still have this board who is going to be the policy leaders of this town. The, the town manager is, you know, an administrator. Um, the town manager, yes, is going to assist this board, um, but I see the elected officials as the leaders of this town, not a staff member who's... You know, just as I would say the Board of Ed, you know, leads school policy. You know, Matt Curtis is, is a exemplary superintendent, but he's not the elected leader. The Board of Ed is. So I, I don't know if that makes you feel better, but it's uh, <laughs> but I think, you know, we should not completely abrogate our <laughs> our leadership role in this. So. I appreciate you saying that, and that's actually the big worry of the transition to town manager exactly. that we hear is that the board of selectmen will abrogate. Oh, its I leadership feel very there. strongly that that yeah. should not yeah. happen. But that's, whoever's on this board. But can't I, get I think you know there's enough responsible elected officials to prevent that from happening. So I'm, I'm not worried about that. <laughs> Mathematically speaking, there will be at least three of us. Yeah. <laughs> at least three of us will be here again in December, and whoever it is, don't be lazy. <laughs> no, and I, I do appreciate all the work and effort, and like you say, there is no right or no wrong decision, and to the extent we get it wrong, actually, um, there's a quote at the end of my... <laughs> My thing Sean, by Franklin the, Roosevelt. The, the Sean Askham yes, select person. It is support. common yeah. sense to take a method and try it. If it fails, admit it frankly and try another. But above all, try something. Mm -hmm. And so you're willing, I, how appropriate for this decision. And that's by Franklin Roosevelt. So I, I think that that's a fair thing. It might be right, it might be wrong. Try it. If we get it wrong, we fix it. Yeah, and my hope is the, the process that's laid out for interviewing, interviewing and selection makes all of us feel that we are hiring a person who has a passion for excellence, uh, consistent with uh, the most passionate of people for the most, uh, for whatever reason it is. So I think our safety valve is we are hiring the right person that we will know will be the right person, and we catch that up in the process. And I think to your point, Chris, that um, holding up those standards really is the Board of Selectmen's job, and make sure that we are relentless in our adherence to those standards. That's that's our single biggest job we can do for the residents of town. I agree. Right, we have a motion. We have a second. Any further discussion? All in favor, please say aye. 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 The motion carries unanimously. Are there any other liaison or updates? Just 
tourism. This is the time of year where there's 8,000 things every weekend. Look at your first select women's report and the town website to see what they are and go to them and have fun. Oh, okay. uh, the Community for Care held an excellent informative program on um, teen stress. And it is, it's my understanding, it's now available on SCTV. So I would encourage you to, to tune in. Um, it has a lot of good information and good discussion um, from some wonderful participants. So you should tune in. Yes, and thank you for hosting that. Very important. And I think uh, well informed. And there are also, if, to the extent you haven't checked out their website, there are multiple TV shows with a lot of great information yeah, yeah. on there. So worth watching. Well, I don't do it alone. <laughs> Chris as well. Oh, it's Chris a great group. Pro Chair yeah. uh, Pastor Woody um, and Sue Harmark Lemke, you know, sort of function as. And a, Mickey. Mickey did a lot of work. Yeah. 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 Yeah, she did. And we right. will miss her. Yes, but she's not far. She lives nearby, so we expect and hope to see her often. Well, if you can't see that truck, shame on you. <laughs> <laughs> really? Fair yeah. enough. The new truck is certainly. Uh, right. Yes, as is she. It suits yes. her personality well. Yeah. All right. Sean had public Sean. safety. No, I'm good. Go ahead. Okay. Okay. May I have a motion uh, to adjourn? So moved. Second. So moved. Any further discussion? All in favor, please say aye. 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 Motion carries unanimously. Thank you, folks. I try. Get me. Well, you, and what is not noted on the special She's meeting is that Cheryl and I were going to rename the water ordinance. After That's right. I told her. We, we, we met. We the sewage treatment plant after you. Yeah. <laughs>